lecturer, Eric Mumford. We are joined by panelists Kenneth Frampton, Jennifer Yost, and Igor Moranovic, as well as um, Robert Carter as moderator. They will share their perspectives on the shifting conditions of modernization and consequential shaping of cities. In addition, Eric will reflect on his trajectory of urban design expertise, including his seminal work, The Sion Discourse on Urbanism, 1928-1960, MIT Press 2000, and Defining Urban Design, CM, Architects, and the Formation of a Discipline, Yale University Press 2009. Lastly, Robert McCarter will act as moderator in a discussion ranging from historical perspectives to urban design models. With Eric Mumford's text as our guide, the dynamic international forces that shape our rapidly changing urban environments will provide ample inspiration for discussion. The Graduate School of Architecture and Urban Design is sponsoring this event with additional support from the Sam Fox School of Eugene J. Mackey Jr. Fund. In particular, I would like to thank also Monica Rivera, the Chair of Graduate Architecture, for her unwavering support of this event and determination to see it through despite the pandemic. This endowed lecture honors one of the premier architects of his time, Mackey, who practiced in the partnership with Joseph Murphy, a former dean of the School of Architecture. Among other projects, Mackey and Murphy designed the John M. Olin Library here on the Washington University campus. In addition, they collaborated with Buckminster Fuller on the design for the Missouri Botanical Gardens Climatron, a dome structure demonstrating various global climates to study variant ecologies. In the spring of 1990, the generous support of Mrs. Mary Layton, widow of Eugene Mackey Jr., established this fund to honor individuals of distinction who have contributed to the quality of the built environment. In order for this afternoon's discussions to flow without interruption, I'm pleased to introduce today's speakers and also Eric's work. First, join me in welcoming Kenneth Frampton, the Ware Professor Emeritus at Columbia Graduate School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation, where he taught since 1972 until his recent retirement in July 2020. Frampton studied architecture at the Architectural Association of London he trained and worked as an architect, the foundation for his distinguished influence as an architectural historian, critic, and curator. In addition to Columbia University, Frampton taught at the AA, Princeton University, and the Architecture Academy in Mendrisio. While tutoring at the AA and practicing in London, he was also an editor of the British journal Architectural Design AD, from 1962 to 65. He was later co-founding editor of the journal Oppositions in 1972 and fellow of the Institute for Architecture and Urban Studies in New York. Professor Frampton received the Golden Lion Lifetime Achievement at the 2018 Venice Biennale, curated by Yvonne Farrell and Shelley McNamara for architecture and his teaching was the subject of the 2017 exhibition Educating Architects Four Courses at the Canadian Centre for Architecture, where is where, which is where his archive was held. Frampton's library was acquired in 2015 by the University of Hong Kong with approximately 10,000 books in the collection. His writing contributions to architecture discipline are too abundant to recite. I will highlight a few for the students in all of us. Towards a critical regionalism, six points for an architecture of resistance in 1983, modern architecture, 1851 to 1945, which was published in 1983, studies in tectonic culture, 1995, labor, work, and architecture from 2002, a Genealogy of Modern Architecture, a Comparative Critical Analysis of Built Form in 2015, and The Other Modern Movement, Architecture 1920-1970. The last book is forthcoming in January 2022, Accentuating Advancements in Construction Techniques, as well as Sociocultural Awareness Reflecting the Legacy of the Modern Movement. 
The theme of the guests at today's forum originates with Professor Kenneth Frampton, with academics whose work began with the practice formation, creating distinct abilities to examine cultural and historic works within a broader framework, from detailed assemblages to social, political, and environmental forces. Joining us also today is Jennifer Yost. Please join her from, uh, welcome her from the University of Minnesota. Um, she is currently head of the School of Architecture and once the Ruth and Norma Moore Professor here at WashU in St. Louis. Jennifer is an architect and educator, previously teaching at the Cooper Union, the University of Arkansas, and as a faculty, faculty member at the University of Minnesota. She was inducted into the American Institute of Architects College of Fellows in 2013, a great honor, principal and president of BJAA in 1997 in Minneapolis with her partner, Vincent James. The firm awards are too numerous to cite, um, but highlights include the AIA National 2012 Architecture Firm Award, 2010 Architect Magazine's Top Firms, ranked number one for design recognition. In 2001, the firm received an American Academy of Arts and Letters Award, and in 1998, Emerging Voices from the Architectural League of New York. Projects include the beautiful renovation, modifications to Marcel Breuer's 1961 St. John's Abbey Church Project, and the Graduate Research and Art Center at the American University of Beirut, 2011. Their practice is known for precision in craft and environmental sensitivity, historical and contextual relevance, and beautiful arrangement with surroundings. BJAA buildings appear effortless with a modesty and pur purposefulness distinguishing the experimental aspects underlying each project, achieving synthetic creative works. And Jennifer exemplifies academic dexterity with her publication, Parallel Cities, the Multi-Level Metropo Metropolis in 2016. Inspired by the elevated footbridges in Minneapolis and St. Paul, the book studies urban conditions found in bridge cities from Minnesota to Hong Kong. Yost's study found its way into our studios in St. Louis as Jennifer explored ideas in the design studio working with our graduate students with the city in the section in 2015 and the synthesized city in 2000, I got that flip, 2015 and the second in 2017. This publication exemplifies the firm's ability to bridge critical scholarly research in parallel with client-based practice that also tackles the implementation and application of research-driven questions. She also co-authored a monograph on her practice published by Princeton Architectural Press. Jennifer's collaborators and awards include those from MIT, the Graham Foundation for Advanced Studies, the Van Allen Prize, and the Harvard University Loeb Fellowship. Please also welcome Igor Moranovic uh, back to our campus after just a few short months away. And he returns as the William Ward Watkin Dean and Professor at Rice you know, Architecture University. Igor's path crosses the territory of educator, scholar, and curator with roots in the architectural profession. Trained as an architect at the University of Belgrade in Serbia, then Yugoslavia, Baranovic completed his undergraduate thesis at the Moscow Architectural Institute he received a master's degree in architecture at the University of Illinois in Chicago and a PhD at the Bartlett School of Architecture at University College London. Igor's works on, he works on many experiences, including his work as an architect in Chicago, as a teacher beginning with the University of Illinois in Chicago and later at Iowa State University. His award-winning work in exhibition and publications includes curating the international exhibition Drawing Ambiance, Alvin Boyarsky and the Architectural Association, which opened at the Kemper Art Museum and also RISD Museum. This work built on his doctoral dissertation at the Bartlett School of Architecture in London. Igor's current projects include works that situate pedagogy with production of innovative drawings, texts, and buildings. He examines Cold War schools of art and architecture in Eastern and Central Europe 
as sites of resistance and instigators of political change. Building upon previous works, such as On the Very Edge, Modernism and Modernity in the Arts and Architecture of Interwar Serbia, 1918-1941. His book, Marina City, was co-authored with Katarina Ruby Ray, Professor of Art History at Bowling Green State University. Together, they engage questions of immigration, diversity, and globalization. Igor is the recipient of an American Institute of Architects Education Honor Award, recognizing his work in the Sam Fox School's Foreign Study Abroad Program. Before joining Rice, Maranovic was Washington University uh, professor for 15 years, I forget that number right, serving as the Joanne Stolaroff Coatson Professor and Chair of Undergraduate Architecture Program. Prior to that, he taught at the University of Illinois at Chicago and Iowa State. Please join me in welcoming Igor. Robert McCarter is the Ruth and Norman Moore Professor of Architecture at the Sam Fox School of Design and Visual Arts since 2008. Previously Director of the School of Architecture at the University of Florida, Robert taught there for 16 years. He held an appointment of Associate Professor and Assistant Dean at the Graduate School of Architecture at Columbia University. In addition, McCarter taught at the Verlage Institute in Rotterdam, North Carolina State University, and was the Frederick Lindley Morgan Distinguished Professor of Architectural Design at the University of Louisville. Robert also received a Distinguished Visiting Scholar position at the American Academy in Rome. Robert was selected as one of the 10 best educators in American schools of architecture in the education issue of Architect Magazine in 2009. In 2018, he participated in the International Curated Exhibit in Free Space, the 16th Biennial of Architecture in Venice by the curators Yvonne Ferra and Shelley McNamara of Grafton Architects. Robert is a prolific writer. Um, here are a few of his publications, including first, Building Machines in 1987, a pamphlet architecture publication that I recall as a point of inspiration during my early part of education um, uh, it's in the late 80s. Um, I'd also like to feature Unity Temple, Frank Lloyd Wright, 1997, Aldo Van Eyck, 2015, a publication, a book on Herman Hertzberger, 2015, Marcel Breuer, in 2016, Grafton Architects, 2018, and lastly, I'll mention co-editor to Modern Architecture and the Life World, Essays in Honor of Kenneth Frampton, 2020. This recently released book includes an essay by historian Mary McLeod, a friend of the school, who's been here uh, several times, uh, placing Frampton as the most influential architectural historian since Siegfried Gideon, uh, a fact that Robert mentioned yesterday in his introduction. From his time at Columbia, Robert's professional and personal friendship with Kenneth Frampton is apparent. Um, his teaching, research, and scholarly publications address not the external formality of a building first, but rather the order of spaces, the construction, and the experiences of inhabitation, with the belief that a comprehensive analysis of an experience of inhabitation leads to the trans transcendental realization of architecture. To get started, I want to give a brief introduction to urban design here at WashU. The College of Architecture at Washington University was established in 1910. And in 1961-62, um, the dates are debated, Robert, Roger Montgomery and Fumimiko Maki initiated the second urban design program in the country, starting just after the GSD. The two schools were also connected through the presence of Jakob Bakema, a member of Team 10 who taught at WashU and the GSD as a visiting professor and also collaborated with Maki in studios exploring ideas such as the ones found in his book, Investigations in Collective Form, published here in 1964. Bakuma, a founder of Team 10, stated that it was the academic's role to communicate how architecture can make visible social relationships with the architect, academic, act as a mentor and educator to public and student. 
He felt a kinship to St. Louis, a place riddled with racially charged issues. Along with other faculty, the 60s and 70s was a time of much experimentation with St. Louis as the subject of study. His studio focused on the redesign of the St. Louis downtown at a time when redevelopment was unrestrained. The social, political, and economic forces of this time led to a city to county migration. This decline in population resulted in massive changes to urban form. As Eric Mumford states in his book on St. Louis, the social mission was unable to adequately respond to these severe social upheavals. We find ourselves in similarly heightened times. Recently, Washington University's new chancellor, Andrew Martin, announced the WashU Compact, a commitment to strengthening community partnerships and impact in, quote, in St. Louis and for St. Louis, with a strategic planning process underway to examine St. Louis initiatives. Listing the city as the top priority, or one of the top priorities, the ambition of addressing many inequities will leverage the academic potential of the university to partner on larger systemic issues in the region. The challenges in St. Louis are global and inseparable. Racism, healthcare and social resource disparities, educational inequities, economic and environmental justice challenges, and a pattern of urban fragmentation. In particular, the Medical School, the Brown School of Social Work, and the Institute of Public Health are focused on large-scale investment in the city to address various forms of segregation. Now to introduce Eric. Eric Paul Mumford is the Rebecca and John Boyles Professor of Architecture in the Sam Fox School of Design and Visual Arts at Washington University in St. Louis. He holds courtesy appointments in art history and archaeology and history in arts and sciences and is a faculty scholar at the Institute for Public Health. As a professor with appointments in many university regions, one gets a sense of Eric's reach and collective impact across many disciplines. A vision of future urban territories depends on global conversations, cultural identities, and agile responses to the environment. Eric's nuanced account of the emergence of this field of study thus meaningfully contributes to transdisciplinary advancement in urban research. Eric's educational background includes Princeton, MIT, the Architectural Association in London, and Harvard College. Academic positions include Washington University in St. Louis, Harvard University, and Columbia University. He formerly served as chair of the Harvard Graduate School of Design Visiting Committee, also teaching at both Harvard University and Columbia <coughs> University. His experience at these institutions coincides with significant scholarly narratives defining the curriculum of urban design and education. In 2013, he was a Fulbright Specialist in Urban Planning at the Catholic University of Peru, Lima. The year following, he received a collaborative grant from the MIT Global Architectural History Teaching Consortium. In addition to his scholarly writings on architecture and urban design, Eric was curator and catalog editor of the Le Corbusier section of Ando and Le Corbusier at Alcawood Exhibitions, a Tadao Ando Design Gallery in Chicago. His scholarly writings are also extensive. Highlights include Designing the Modern City, Urbanism Since 1850, published in 2018, The Writings of Joseph Louis Sert in 2015, Defining Urban Design, CM Architects and the Formation of a Discipline, 2009, The Architect of Urban Design, Joseph Louis Sert, 2008, co-edited with Hashim Sarkis, Modern Architecture in St. Louis, 1948-1973, Washington University and Post-War American Architecture, 1948-1973, that published in 2004, The CM Discourse on Urbanism, 1928-1960, published in 2000. Professor Mumford's urban design and CM experience connect to a strong teaching legacy at Washington University of Team 10 influence ideas surfacing through the international practitioners such as Balkrishna Doshi, Aldo Van Eyck, Hans Holein, Shadrach Woods, Dolph Schneebly, and others. Our guest, Kenneth Frampton, was a part of that network 
with Team 10 ideas disseminated through art exhibitions and events, publications, and design studios taught at the AA. Professor Mumford sees his place in history among a network of past and future connections. He passionately contributes his knowledge, support, and friendship to the next generation of scholars and practitioners. I can personally attest to the generous collaborations, connections, and faculty recommendations that Eric shares so freely. We are fortunate to benefit from his unwavering care for his community, from someone of his international reputation continually engaged in demanding research. He sets a high bar and then builds a creative and inclusive culture, one that is very approachable. Hashim Sarkis, who also compared Eric to Siegfried Gideon, once said to me, Eric's research is done with the precision of an activist. He writes with the fluidity of a lyricist. He sees with the eyes of an architect and finds novelty with the passion of an eternal student. It is now my pleasure to welcome Kenneth Frampton to start his presentation. Scholarly production and the amount of it that, that anyone can cover 
And it's the other mother, the newest mother, I think, who at some point said, you know, one of the problems of the future will be that we have so much information we're unable to process it. It's clearly that this is absolutely the world we live in. I mean, we're not able to process all this information. And a lot of it, of course, is redundant in any case. It's not really information, it's just noise. And Eric's book is surely not noise at all. It's very stimulating. And um, so I wanted to just to touch on another thing which the book reminded me of, which is this evokes the, the uh, what can I say, the spirit of Colin Rowe, because Colin Rowe gave me a book which is by Carl Becker called the, he uh, the Heavenly City of the 18th Century Philosophers, I think. And in that book, there is this most amazing statement. And, this, and Eric Cook reminded me of this, and of course, who could not be, but it's actually an unbelievable remark by Carl Becker, which historical mindedness is so much a habit of modern thought that we cannot say what a thing is before pointing toward that which it was, before that which it is, before it will presently cease to be. You know, this idea that we've no longer got it and it's gone, and, and uh, you know, the, well, history is absolutely necessary, I think, but yes, extremely necessary. But I think there is this kind of irony that one can't simply, the, the rate of change is so fast, it goes along with the information. <coughs> that, you know, the, this book of Becker was some time ago, in the, probably the early 60s, you know. Um, not an I'm a philosopher, historian. And, uh, Cornell University, otherwise, uh, of course, Colin would know it because of Cornell University, you know, on the same, you know, in the same university. And uh, I, I, you know, it's engraved in my memory this remark about history, you know, not being able to say what a thing is before it became that which it will presently cease to be, you know. Uh, it's amazing, I think. So, opening remarks. It's a very ambitious book, but, but you know, this question of, uh, in a way, what is curious, I think, it, it's beautifully written, it's very scholarly, all those things, but, you know, it's not, in a funny way, it's not didactic, because, you know, the illustrations, are not enough illustrations, and, and the, you know, illustrations and extended captions, which is what you have, I think, in Gideon, you know, is, you know, fundamental, but how can one persuade any publisher, particularly you know, Yale University Press, which is, I would say, uh, well, uh, probably most publishers, including university publishers, have difficulty in breaking even, you know, so there's another reason why they're so tight-fisted, and, uh, and they don't want to spend money on printers, and they don't want to spend, they prefer not to spend money on anything, oh. you know, uh, this is who they are, basically. And, and uh, they are, they're not alone, of course, you know. So there's that, which is a, you know, a sad tale which transcends, you know, although it is, you know, somehow reflected, I think, in the book. You know, this, this question of uh, the role of the illustrations. You know. I mean, they're, they're, they're pertinent all these illustrations, but anyway, I think it gets the point. So the, uh, there are other things that, uh, many other things, where I'm at, you know, so many notes on them, where to go next. Yes. Well, I, I, it wouldn't be a bad moment to sort of begin to work my way towards a conclusion. <laughs> but, because there are a lot of people, I think, who want to contribute, and we don't have to discuss it in any case. But um, I think one of the touching parts of the book, which is also sort of underplayed, is this, uh, this this image of Stalin and uh, Kaganovich, you know, uh, you know, this public relations operation uh, about the plan of Moscow. You know, having, uh, you know, because uh, as you probably know, the, you see I'm uh, uh, gathering, you know, should have taken place in Moscow in 1903, was confused by the, the Soviets, you know, because 1901, of course, is the end of the, of the modern project, modern socialist project. I think you know, the way definitively the end with, with the Urkhaz of 1931, that's it, socialist realism, pillars for the people, you know. But the, the, uh, the plan of Moscow doesn't 
I, I don't know, I mean, because it's not analyzed here. There's no reason why it should be, but, but uh, it's very undistinguished. But one thing that Eric, I think, does not say is that Le Corbusier's radio, radio city was a plan for Moscow. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, rejected, of course. You know. And this brings me to Corbusier, because um, what is amazing, I think, is the degree to which Le Corbusier inherited, I mean, always keeping it under wraps, so to speak, the Russian socialist avant-garde project, because, you know, if you think of the up the end of the Second World War, which reminds me, of course, that you know, 1937 is the ultimate kind of uh, betrayal of the socialist cultural project, in as much as the uh, well, the, these countries that would become the Allied powers, so to speak, completely what it then to do with the Spanish Republic, the Spanish Republic, of course, is completely destroyed by Franco. That's it. 1937 is it bad moments, and of course it is a rehearsal for the Second World War, without a doubt. Uh, and it, it follows short order. But, but look up today, after this war, I mean, that, I find that incredibly uh, touching at all. Because you know, the three human establishments which Eric illustrates, yeah. a key, key book, you know, is well, almost thrown away, you know, a uh, very light book. That, that combines, you know, the linear city as inherited from Arturo Soro Yamata, uh, plus the radio concentric traditional city, plus agricultural settlements, right? These are the three human establishments. And uh, that's all, you know, it's, it's an extension of the Russian idea, but into a kind of regional network. And uh, that's what makes it so, so stimulating, in a way, uh, I think, and it's, it's, I think it has connections to what Cristal's Cristal central place location is, that I think is also pre and post war, I'm not sure when, because, or yeah. how look, look, look is it ever mentioned. Yeah. But the other thing, of course, is the USA must say, because in the end, it is a Russian Soviet Don Comuna realized, you know, that's what it is. You know, it's, it's a question about it, you know. And, and uh, so the Russians never build the Don Comuna. He built, because he did, or Eugene Flores Petit as Minister of Reconstruction. Uh, without him, of course, nothing. That's an interesting story in itself because Eugene Flores Petit had been a, a cabinet maker, enters the French underground during the war, becomes an amazing uh, commander of uh, guerrilla forces against the Germans, and of course, the Gaulle rewards him with the Ministry of Reconstruction. <laughs> and this, otherwise, the Ministry would not be there. So that these, uh, I know, the, somehow this whole picture of Stalin and Kajanovich, but some of you know, just triggered it off in a way uh, as something that is latent, it's not uh, entered into in the book in a way. Um, and uh, so much is covered in the book. Um, I think, um, ah yes, it brings me to make it my final point which is uh, this question of the future of urban design inside university. Because I, I think you know, with Eric has the example in this book. Has, I mean, I'm so kind of uh, stimulated by this book that I realize you know, it just opens the door to so much uh, potential research you know, for universities. By the way. But in some ways, like if I think of your urban design at Columbia, for example, it's just a joke, you know. It doesn't. It's not there anymore, basically, in urban planning. They're both kind of very, very weak. Uh, they're, they're kind of as if uh, academic disciplines, but then nothing is happening at all, really. Given also the world we're living in, nothing is happening. You know? I mean, there's a lot of well-meaning talk, of course, and you know, sustainability and you know, what redistribution of wealth, etc. Yeah, ordering on the politically correct, you know. Well, that's, that's dangerous, dangerous to get into that controversial term. But uh, it, it's kind of, it's, I, well, basically, it's kind of, you know, it's kind of closed. The situation is really closed. And, and the potential for opening is sitting right there in a, in a university like this, you know, with someone like Eric. But, but of course, you know, much, much, a lot has to go behind it, you know. I mean, this 
We don't know anything. I mean, I'm talking to Eric about Curitiba and the fact that I don't know anyone who's been to Curitiba. Perhaps there's something in this room who's been to Curitiba, but it's like Curitiba is sitting there, has been sitting there since the mid 60s, and, and it is an extraordinary achievement, I think. But not only really in Curitiba. I mean, for example, Ballinby, which uh, Eric mentioned right in Sweden, but what do we know about Ballinby? I don't know anybody who studied Ballinby, you know. I mean, like these cities were tried, you know, and, and they, 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 they didn't die on the vine. They're not just projects, they're out there, they're working. And Tapiola is a similar story. You know? And, and uh, so what do we know about these places? No, we don't know anything, you know. Maybe they even aren't remembered by many uh, urban design, uh, urban fact, uh, planning uh, faculty, whatever, you know. In Colombia, who talks about Valley Bay or Tapiola or or Curitiba, no, you know, or Bogota, for that matter, you know, which is partly related to Curitiba. So I think that's the challenge for, for it's a very exciting challenge. I think this book is, in a way, spells out that in, in, a, in an amazing way, you know, because it goes over, uh, I mean, it's all there, you know, this question of the, of the, of the response, the socio-economic response to the to the problem of the big city, you know, the, well, it goes right back, of course, to the problem of the inherited medieval city. And that brings me, and that maybe is, I'm going to end on that, which is this beautiful aphorism of uh, Agan. We can say that the Renaissance city never existed. What existed was the medieval city with projections of Renaissance, you know, vision dotted about in Florence and elsewhere, of course, many in France. Uh, yeah, we can say the Renaissance city never existed. It's such a profound insight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Kenneth, for your opening thoughts. And uh, I'll try to follow with some reflections on uh, Eric's book and then how some of the key topics from there link to the kind of research that uh, I've been doing in my own sort of uh, historical research relative to both architecture and urbanism. So before I do that, thank you to Heather, Monica, Eric, and Robert for having me here. It's wonderful to be back. Uh, it's great to be in Houston, but I feel part of my heart still is here in, in St. Louis. It's great to be here with so many familiar faces and friends and students. So thank you. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, my remarks will be about uh, drawing on urbanism, um, in a way how urbanism links to the idea of drawing and discussion about drawing, both in schools of architecture in terms of practice, uh, and how that links to some of the topics that Eric is raising in his uh, book. Uh, Eric, you're a wonderful scholar and a model to many of us and a mentor in how we can approach uh, scholarly and historical material. Um, there are many threads in the book that I feel we can tease out and, and, and dig deeper and study them um, uh, in terms of like how they relate uh, to different aspects of architecture, and in particular how they relate to history of architecture. I've isolated just three over here, which I felt were really resonating, uh, in particular with the kind of research that uh, I've been interested in. Um, one is that urbanism in an, is an international and cross-cultural phenomenon. What I really appreciated about Eric's book is that uh, there is not really a nation state that dominates how we frame a particular history of a period or a city or even a region. He really cuts across across many different countries, many different continents, and tries to establish a dialogue between those places by means of historical discourses, drawings, buildings, how people moved around, and how ideas moved around uh, between, between different geographical regions. And for that, um, I think it's a very interesting contribution to writing a global history of architecture without 
being overly cumulative, without trying to be an encyclopedia of the entire architecture of the world. And I think Eric is very careful in straddling that fine line, trying to expose different kinds of discourses, different kinds of geographies, without really uh, providing so much information, like Kenneth said, challenges that there is too much information in some of the global histories, to the point where oftentimes it's hard to connect those pieces of inf information uh, and create a cohesive narrative. The second one, um, and I think it's a very interesting one for all of us, uh, is that urbanism is a true domain of architectural education in practice. In a way, there is no true separation between architecture, urban design, urban planning in some ways, but what architects do is uh, not only building buildings, but building cities. And I think the book is a really strong case uh, in that regard, in part because almost all of the case studies move between different scales in a very, very fluid way. And I think that's something um, that I feel oftentimes is understood as a kind of a basic premise of architecture, but I also feel it's sometimes also misunderstood too, and I think it'll be interesting to have a conversation about that uh, later on as part of the panel. How does urbanism fit into architectural education and how truly we are dedicated to that aspect? And then uh, one, one final thought out of many, many interesting topics in the book is um, that um, urbanism is an artifact. The architecture is an artifact-based practice. Um, and I think what Eric sort of means by that through his case studies is that there is a physicality to architecture that embodies intellectual ideas. So those two things are not separate, but they're kind of embedded together in a piece of architecture, a building, a city, and a neighborhood. And he doesn't shy away from analyzing architecture as a physical space, all while being very uh, attentive to the socioeconomic context in which those pieces of architecture are produced. And I think oftentimes for us as historians, we fall in the trap of one or the other. We either overemphasize the socioeconomic context or political context on the one hand, or we sort of fetishize the products of architecture, the buildings and the drawings. And I think Eric has done a really great job on, in connecting those two and showing how they're really connected in almost all of the case studies that he is presenting. So what is interesting for me to reflect back now uh, as, I, as I look at these streams, two, uh, three themes is how in my own work, I try to sort of analyze how different ideas about urbanism have emerged by means of drawings, by means of buildings, and how the artifacts have manifested these different ideas about both building form and also political ideas. One of the key research areas where I was invested as a scholar is to study uh, the Architectural Association in London in the 70s and 80s under the leadership of a person called Alvin Boyarsky, which was a period when many architects defined new ideas about buildings and cities by experimenting with drawing. Um, and for me, that was an interesting sort of tile, again, back to Eric's work, which is in, at that moment in time, the architects were really invested in the physicality of architecture, either on drawing as a made artifact or how it might project into the actual space. Uh, and Eric's last chapter about the crisis of ut utopia speaks a little bit to that moment, how the drawing allowed architects in this particular moment in time to rethink the utopian models of the historical avant-garde of the 20s and the 30s. And the example that he's using is Bernard Schumi's Parc de la Villette, a winning competition, which again, interestingly enough, uh, is a, represented with a drawing, even though we all know it as a built project. But in some ways, I think the drawings of this project project that have greater longevity than the actual built work. And I think it's an interesting thing for us to think about when you're building a historical material, a book or an essay, do you use a drawing of a building or do you use the actual photograph of a, of a building? What speaks better to that particular idea? At the AA in the 70s and 80s, many architects tried to develop new ideas about urbanism by experimenting with drawing. They typically partnered also with artists to use color, to use figure drawing as a way to sort of uh, provide a sort of a subtle and sometimes not so subtle critique of modernism and introduce the idea of a user, the idea of, a, in this case, park as a social condenser. So these are both proposals for Parc de la Villette, Alex Wall on the left, Bernard or OMA on the left and Bernard Schumi on the right, with the idea that this park proposal is not a picturesque space or a landscape, but it's a social condenser. And for the OMA, it was the idea of a skyscraper turned horizontally to become a park. 
So where do these ideas come from? Um, as historians, we try to look at them as a kind of a genealogy of ideas, looking back at what people read, what is the intellectual foundation. So in my own work, I looked at the work of uh, Alvin Boyarsky, and he was a collector of postcards. So um, it was interesting that he spent a lot of time writing letters and writing postcards, including to Colin Rowe, who uh, Kenneth Frampton just mentioned. They would exchange during one period of time in the 50s and 60s, they would exchange postcards uh, on a daily basis and letters. There is a number of postcards that are written like day after day talking about the urban experience. And for me, kind of delving a little bit deeper into that idea of a letter writing and the postcard was an important aspect to understand how these ideas emerged uh, in the, at the AA. So I, I'll read a few snip, sort of s s short sort of excerpts of some of these letters and postcards. Quote, I learned a rather nice word the other day from an American anthropologist, culture shock. It's what Zulus get when they come to London or the English when they go to Iowa. My dear Elizabeth, you are destined to suffer from it all your life. You had it in Montreal, in Ithaca, now in, England, now in Eugene. And you will have it just as badly when you get back to London. End of quote. That was Colin Rowe writing to Elizabeth and Alvin Boyarsky as they were adjusting to a life in U Eugene, Oregon, which was very different from the places they came from, which is Canada and, um, uh, and, and the UK. So at that time, Boyarsky was reading books like, again, mentioned Space, Time, and Architecture. He wrote a, a thesis on Camilo Zite, uh, who wrote about the kind of importance of historical cities. So it's kind of an interesting merger of a very modern textbook and that's an interesting word we should discuss in relationship to uh, Eric's work, the idea of a textbook as a model for writing, and then Camilo Zite, who was a more of a historical uh, historian, so to speak. I know it's a little bit of a um, of a repetition, but uh, Zite really championed the idea of a traditional European city. But at the same time, Boyarsky also read uh, authors like Matthew Arnold, uh, who was a traveling cultural critic in the 19th century, looking, visiting small towns in England and trying to understand how a small town in England is different from a metropolitan an area, uh, and then Matthew Arnold was an influence on someone called Isaiah Berlin, a very famous philosopher, who wrote about people being either as hedgehogs or foxes. And this is what later on Colin Rowe adapts uh, in his study of the collage city. So you can see that in this case, uh, we have an architect uh, trained as an architect at McGill, Boyarsky, then becoming an urban planner at Cornell, writing a thesis uh, on Cite, but also reading from cultural theory and trying to understand how what we do as architects links to the larger cultural aspect of life. And then Boyarsky moves to Chicago. This is his kind of first major teaching position, and this is what he writes back to Colin Rowe from Chicago. I'll try not to read everything because of the kind of language being used there, but I apologize. It is a historical archival material that we as, as historians have to look at. Quote, we hope to do our bit by channeling the students' energies and upsetting the static curricula and unthinking activities of so many of the staff. It's amazing what can be done in 48 hours. The motto universally is beep Nixon, and more locally, build people, not buildings, end quote. So as a young faculty member in Chicago, Boyarsky is writing from a faculty meeting uh, where they had a sit-in and a protest against the American involvement in Vietnam. So this is another uh, interesting episode in the life of this particular academic and architect that starts to shape his thinking about the city, and I'll come to that in just one point, where architects uh, work not only as professors and educators, but also as activists, sometimes because they were prompted to, to do so by uh, their students, in this case, barricaded students at the University of Illinois uh, at Chicago. There, uh, they have sit-ins to protest against the American involvement in different wars around the world, but also against the increasing op oppression, police oppression, uh, in particular against the African-American uh, population in the United States, trying to make, make the link between the sort of American imperialism abroad and what was happening in the country. And this directly starts to affect Boyarsky's historical scholarship as an urban historian. Uh, very soon after these events, he edits a very special issue of AD uh, from 1970 uh, that's called Chicago a la carte, City as an Energy System. So rather than city as a textbook or city as a kind of a neat monograph on a particular topic, he develops a historic history historical narrative about the city uh, written or based or inspired by his collection of picture postcards. This is actually a box where the uh, postcards were stored, uh, and from there he picks the kind of 
unusual suspects to kind of write about the history of the city, the O'Hare Airport, the McCormick Center on the south side, the Convention Center, the parking lot, uh, the hog killing device. So as opposed to writing the history of the Chicago school, he was writing, Boyarsky was writing the history of the kind of infrastructure, oftentimes using postcards that people sort of accidentally sent to him as illustrations in his work. Um, on the top, actually, uh, Heather is a postcard from Dennis Crompton, who used to teach here and co-taught with Heather as well, uh, a good and old friend of the school, who sent this interesting picture of the gigantic apple on the, on the, uh, on the train car, with the idea that this kind of popular imagery until that moment was not quite fully used as a kind of a visual evidence uh, for the history of architecture. And, she, and, and Boyarsky tries to re rewrite that by writing this essay called Chicago a la carte, and then in there he writes about the O'Hare Airport, or about Marina City as a kind of a futuristic development, and then ends with these images of riots uh, in Chicago surrounding the 1968 Democratic Convention, the, the violence by the police, and the question, what does it mean that on the same page of the Chicago Tribune we have the announcement of the tallest building in the world, which is at that time the Sears Tower, and the major political upheaval and violence in the city um, on, in, in Chicago. Uh, surrounding the, the political protests with the idea and, a, and an open question, what does it mean to link uh, politics and, and architecture? Quote, the thing one learned about Chicago was that the people were victims and prisoners really of the circumstances of the development of, development of that kind of the capitalist situation. And while I didn't see myself as being a political animal in that one wants to overthrow situations as they exist, what I did see was that a whole possible way of being useful was to practice a kind of architecture and urbanism which is outside, outside the system." End quote. And this, in part, was what prompted Boyarsky to then actually start to look towards the Architectural Association in London, again, as Heather mentioned, a school that also Eric went in the early, early 80s, and to start to experiment with architectural education there, which ultimately would lead to the experimental kinds of drawings and practices that we will see later on in the architects uh, that I show at the beginning of the presentation, like OMA and Bernard Schumi. So he starts this program called uh, International Institute of Design Summer Sessions, where uh, students can come to London for a few weeks. They are mailed a set of stamps and cards, and they can pick their own tutor or a faculty member by detaching the stamp, returning back to the office, which was, you know, at that point, his house in London, and then they would be matched into different kinds of workshops and events and lectures based on those interests. So the idea that architecture starts to, or that the architectural education starts to dissolve, it's not a curriculum anymore, but it kind of a system of events and menus, what, what drove this experiment called the International Institute of Design Summer Sessions. There were only three of them held between 1970 and 1972, but they were interesting because they brought together many of the international protagonists protagonists, which later on would become part of the Architectural Association in London between the 70s and 80s, and drove the school forward, including in its drawing practices. This is the events sheet from the summer sessions, which later on resurfaced uh, as the sort of um, events list at the AA that was one of the most widely publicized publications of the school, which simply was a directory of different kinds of events uh, at the school at that time. And actually, I think this one Eric might have come from you, from your collection uh, of the events that you saved. Eric is really good about saving uh, any kind of historical ma material. So even ha he has his own student handouts from the 1980s that actually I was um, benefiting from uh, in my own research. So this is just a reminder to all of us, um, don't throw anything away because it could be a historical evidence later on. Um, from there, uh, Boyarsky works with the Archigram Group uh, to develop uh, a, a public publication for the summer session called the Manhattan Workshop. Uh, where they experiment with the ideas of uh, new uses of urban spaces, including by analyzing and talking to the residents of high rises in New York City and Chicago, and what does it mean to live on the 19th floor, and what kind of drawing practices can capture that kind of, uh, that kind of urban, urban experience. By 1972, he fully, Boyarsky fully moves to the A, where he becomes the, uh, the chair of the school for the next 20th year, 20 years. But this idea of the kind of a dissolved curriculum of the summer 
summer sessions is what comes to the uh, what comes to the A in the kind of curriculum that he had developed. And uh, again, uh, Kenneth Frampton is the primary historical witness of these events because he too was a part of the search for the chair and, and had a very distinguished practice uh, uh, in London, connected to different magazines, a different uh, culture group that really pushed the architecture at that time in this particular place. Um, these are the sort of historical diagrams you know from your survey classes with Eric and Chantel, uh, looking at the uh, at the kind of Bauhaus diagram, the idea of school as a curriculum, which endlessly in the 60s, the uh, chairs, or at that time, the heads and the principals of the AA schools tried to rework and to develop a new diagram. Uh, but what actually eventually happened at the AA was um, not a diagram of a school or a curriculum, but a series of um, areas of study, phenomenology, uh, construction, uh, printmaking even, and how architects can you engage these topical elements to engage different uh, pressing issues of their time. So in other words, the option studio became the model based on which the school was completely reorganized, and that was best manifested in these books called The Themes where each book featured a different publication from a different option studio, which at the, at, at the AA is called a unit system, kind of loosely, uh, loosely associated with that, which is a two-year program where students study with a particular faculty or team of faculty to explore a particular issue. And oftentimes the units really get invested into their own language. This is an example of a book by um, Moisan Mostafavi and Dali Vesely, which looked at the idea of a historical city and trying to revive that through uh, for example, in this case, pencil drawings and rendering. So um, there was a lot of exploration of trying to find a particular visual language in a particular unit. So rather than kind of overarching language for the whole school, there was investment in a particular unit or option studio to define their language, oftentimes in relationship to the city or like in the case of Peter Wilson, in relationship to a human figure, which became another one kind of these important uh, elements of the school uh, at that time. So what resulted from this was a dialogue because the units were two years long between the students and the faculty and oftentimes the work of the students got back into the work of the faculty. So there's a lot of similarities between the drawings of the faculty and drawings of the students. A lot of the projects were urban in nature. That was a very interesting thing that before many of architects of these architects like Peter Wilson, like Zaha Hadid, before they started to build buildings and to draw buildings, they were drawing cities and neighborhoods. In case of Peter Wilson, oftentimes neighborhoods in Tokyo because so many of his students came from Japan uh, in the 1980s, and uh, that's the series of publications, or one of the series of publications that came from the AA at that time called uh, The Folios, capturing some of this really vibrant work of architects and their students uh, in how they engaged, uh, engaged the city in particular. Um, and one of these experiments I think is particularly significant because it's the work of Zaha Hadid, who was both a student at the AA during that period when Boyarsky was the chair, uh, but also became a very influential faculty member and obviously uh, later on a practicing architect, someone who was very influenced by the very material presented in uh, Eric's book. Oftentimes I feel like her work is presented in kind of isolation and autonomy. She was a very careful student of Russian constructivism and tried to find a way how an unfinished project of constructivism and modernism more broadly could be finished and what kind of role drawing can make in the kind of finishing of that particular project. And this is one of her more famous drawings from the AA called um, The World or 89 Degrees, questioning the idea of a 90 degree angle in buildings and suggesting what does it happen if we redraw the world in a kind of oblique projection and, and, and what, if, what if we design the buildings not in sort of a 90 degree model but in a completely different, uh, different type of setup. So this skewed world of the uh, view of the world is an interesting one because in this drawing there are miniature reproductions of Hadid's buildings around the world. I think there is the peak Hong Kong, the peak in Hong Kong, the Park de la Villette project, which she also entered, the Irish Prime Minister's residence in Dublin. Uh, and what she's doing, she's sort of pulling together different cultural references in this distorted format to suggest that architecture now operates in this sort of interconnected world and that the world of urbanism in a way in this case what looks almost like the scale of the city is inseparable uh, from the uh, from the scale uh, of the urban urban environment. So 
I will reflect on this idea of the scale of the world and scale of the city by looking also a little bit closer to home now uh, in the kind of work that emerged uh, in Houston at Rice Architecture around the same time and what kind of new ideas about ur urbanism uh, emerged over there. Sometimes Houston and urbanism are not quite synonymous, but actually there is a lot of research and exploration into what, are, what can architects do at the city that links back to the, um, uh, to the work at, the, at Rice Architecture in the 70s and 80s in particular. This is an image uh, of a project by Charles Colbert, a New Orleans-based architect who ran uh, workshops at Rice Architecture in the 60s where he designed uh, this, uh, let's call it a headpiece for a lack of a better world, a word, uh, where architects and students walked around Rice campus and into the neighborhoods trying to process the exact oversaturation of information that Kenneth uh, Frampton was describing. Uh, the street signs, the uh, you know six and eight and ten lanes of traffic and trying to really understand the city through some kind of device that mediates that experience between the uh, individual uh, and the city. Um, and in the 1960s and 70s, the school organized a number of, number of workshops, uh, most notably a series of FETs or workshops called New Schools for New Town uh, ran by uh, Will Kennedy, still a faculty member at Rice over there in the middle with a, uh, with a tie that brought a number of faculty from around the world to experiment and question what would the city of the future look like using the kind of immense growth that the city of Houston was experimenting in the 1950s uh, as a laboratory. Cedric Price uh, ran a number of workshops and I love him kind of so focusedly working over there and drawing and uh, puzzled students looking at what is happening on the paper and this um, also two students over there trying to have a conversation through the headpiece. But Many of the people listed here also participated in workshops in London at the AA in the 1970s and 80s with an idea that a lot of these dialogues about the city, as they are in the Eric's book, were not isolated to a particular place, but they actually connected along many different places. Uh, Niklaus Morgenthaler, for example, over there was one of Boyarsky's closest friends and collaborator from his time not only in London, but also Chicago and, um, and Eugene, Oregon. So the new, cities, new schools for new towns came, that workshop came with a number of proposals as to how architects can design new schools basically for a car society and obviously uh, you know the society of the 1960s and 70s and this is a proposal by Denise Scott Brown and Robert Venturi for a drive-through school uh, in Texas where you know you can maybe come to the booth get your textbook or information then drive to your home and do like a remote learning in the evening in case you have a day job and that prevents you from attend attend a regular school campus so the idea was that kind of education in this case is deeply linked to urbanization so to link about to think about about the future city, you need to think about in a way about the you know, the school system in this case, or schools in general. And this comes from Cedric Price, who already did these experiments in, um, uh, in London. So if you think this looks a little bit like learning from Las Vegas, and you know, in particular, Denise Scott Brown's language, it's true. Uh, Denise Scott Brown ran a number of workshops uh, at Rice as well. Actually, the three sort of famous workshops is what they did at, you know, in Levittown, um, in Las Vegas. And the third one was actually in Houston at Rice, uh, focused on a street called called Westheimer. Um, the best way to describe Westheimer is I think it's close to Manchester Avenue uh, in St. Louis. It's one of those streets that runs for miles and miles and miles and has just about everything. So when you move to Houston and you ask someone, well, where is the good photo store? Where, the, where is a good you know, store for this or that? Or where is a good restaurant? Everybody says, oh, it's on Westheimer or it's on Westheimer. So it's literally like Manchester here. You can find pretty much any kind of business uh, on this avenue that goes for a you know, number of miles throughout the whole city. So Denise Scott Brown asked the students to come up with the worst ideas for best, you know, worst outcomes for best possible ideas with a kind of, with a challenge to kind of think about what happens when architecture goes wrong. Like the, that you don't only, pre, you know, present a project for a great building or a great city or a great urban proposal. So you do that, uh, but the part of the challenge is what if you lose control? Uh, what happens when that building doesn't go as planned and how you can plan for that scenario? And a number of projects came from that studio that looked at the both kind of the new fabric of the city that looked at the strip malls and whatnot, but also the renovation of some of the historical buildings. Yes, there is historical architecture in Houston as well, maybe not as much as here in Houston, but there is some interesting fabric. And I just really like these images of student projects using flowers and different kind of patterns to sort of try to think about how the whole city could be designed by working with the facades. And it's something that again, links back directly to their work in the firm, Denise Scott Brown and Robert Venturi or Rauch uh, Venturi Scott 
Brown, where a lot of these colorful schemes become actually blueprints for their projects. There is, uh, uh, again, Jennifer close to home, uh, the Hennepin Avenue in, uh, in Minneapolis, uh, drawn by James Timberlake, the, one of the lead architects of this building that we are in right now. Um, and then the other one, which is in Galveston, uh, Texas, which is a renovation for the Strand uh, in, the city, uh, in the city of Galveston. So what does this mean for the future thinking of the city is a kind of a question that resonates for me uh, right now. And if I can say the greatest greatest lesson is that maybe we don't know what lies ahead, maybe I don't know what lies ahead, but I think to look ahead you kind of need to look back. And this is where Eric's work was always very inspirational to me, which is to provide a context in which how we can think about architects and to, th to think about that in our very complex moment in time it's always helpful to look back and to understand how architects have grappled with that in the history, and in particular, how they embrace the sort of the artifact and the project of architecture as a very, very physical phenomenon. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me to speak. Um, uh, th the way I'm going to talk about this uh, is really um, admiration from this book, and, and I wish that it had existed 20 years ago because it would have answered a lot of questions in my own education and my own research and my practice. Um, uh, uh, my story also kind of begins at the AA, uh, where I was a student in the mid-'90s. And um, the interest that I have that kind of uh, had ha helped me to meet Eric, um, kind of began there on the multi-level city. Um, I, I used a lot of Eric's work uh, in kind of developing, um, uh, with my partner Vincent, uh, the book uh, Parallel Cities. And then um, Eric was generous enough to, I just called him cold one day and started asking him a lot of questions, very naive because I was an architect, not an academic, um, and we just had this obsession. And he pointed out to me all of the dangerous things that we were doing and talking about <laughs> and uh, um, why they were problematic, which was incredibly generous and helpful. And then Eric also uh, came to uh, speak at Minnesota as part of a seminar uh, that we did with Walker Art Center and Andrew Blauvelt in the school um, on, on multi-level cities and, and gave this wonderful overview of a lecture that um, had a lot of elements of, of his current book. Um, what I think is really wonderful about this book and why I think it's unique um, and, and why I've been searching for something like this um, is it really does come from a design perspective, from how architecture uh, is done, how ideas spread, um, how, how it enters the world. Um, and I think it also doesn't put it into compartments. You know, it, it, it acknowledges history from the 1850s to the present and, and sees it as an interconnected thing, not things that happen in isolated, disconnected parts of the world or, or moments, um, but really how ideas spread. Um, I, th I think another really important piece, um, and, and the story when I was at the AA, uh, we had the graduate studios and the design research lab in the Alfred Place, and at four o'clock when it got dark, I could see into Cedric Price's office across the street and, and watch what they were doing, and he would be on the street, and um, Zaha Hadid was around, and um, there was so much discussion about ideas that in Minneapolis were taboo, the elevated city. And in Minneapolis, the systems that um, had basically migrated in, in, our, in my, our later perspective um, from these academic places and, and these ideas um, you know, in, into the everyday and were being implemented for very different reasons, um, kind of had their beginnings in, in these places. And kind of how, how that connection happens was really a, an obsession for us. Um, I, I think the other part of it is just why urbanism is so interesting to architects. And, and I also see that a lot in 
um, Eric's book. You know, the, the idea of, of how architectural history is developed and how we look at buildings is very different than how we look at cities. And much of um, how we look at cities misses some of these things that are really rich about architecture and how they might connect. Um, I, I think for a long time, as practitioners, we've been interested in, in what Eric describes as what urbanism is about, you know, the, the social, the technical, the economic, um, and how this generates new forms and new ideas, and, and how that, that kind of becomes part of everything we do and how we practice. Um, I, I wanted to thank you for including me, um, Monica, um, Heather, um, Eric. Uh, it, this, I've been looking forward to this for two years, um, and, and, and to have a chance to honor Eric's wonderful book, which um, by the present time I have three copies of. Um, I, I, I bought one, I lost it, I bought another one, I found the other one, and, and then I was sent a copy. So um, un unlike Kenneth, um, I, I have the riches of, of multiple versions. Um, uh, when I was teaching here, um, I, I spoke several times to Eric's research methods course, and, and I always found his way of framing the role of research and of history relative to practice is very productive uh, to our own work. Uh, to me, Eric's work always asks a provocative and, and complicated question, which is how is re history relevant to architects, to how we, we still work and how we practice? Um, not as a kind of stylistic references, but as questions and ideas and that migrate and have relevance at different times and in different places. Um, I, I, I would like to show kind of a little bit of our work on parallel cities um, in this book um, uh, to show this idea also of an immersion urban history um, and, and how, how it affects kind of thinking about the city and how, how it... Um, it exists both in low and high forms. Um, I think er Eric's points uh, in the book about utopias, you know, about how um, these ideas enter in, um, how they're determined to be problematic, how they, how they morph, how they change into other things, um, but really how they enter the world um, and how they exit. Um, I, I think the other part of it that I was always fascinated with, um, with the academic culture is that much of what we assume is that we have no impact on the world. And the way we teach and the, the, the way we develop ideas and the conversations we have, we think are, are much more insulated than they really are. And, and it was very odd for us in our research um, to really look at how these ideas move from place to place. And um, here we are in the Midwest and things, um, you know, from very different places and times are, are really having major impacts on us, even though we're not aware of it. Um, in Minneapolis, there are always these stories about how the multi-level city started, and it was always this great man theory, and it was some developer usually, um, kind of, you know, who just had this idea out of the blue, um, and, and you figured out that he actually had seen it somewhere and it migrated in. Um, and every time that we would see this, you know, usually in the local paper, they would bring up this unusual thing we have, um, the Skyway system, um, and where it came from. And they never really understood history. Or, and, and the way to impact it would be they would bring in experts, and the experts would say, take it down, um, that this was a bad idea. Um, and, and there would be this back and forth, and it would cycle in and out. Um, I, I think a, another part of this is also, um, oops, sorry here, having a little trouble with my, um, the idea of a comprehensive survey, as in Eric's book, is that historical progression, rather than focusing on a singular period or stylistic development, allows us to understand these forms that were created um, and their impacts and their successes and failures. And I think the conversation that how do we, how do we go back and look at these um, conditions that have been developed and, and what is our responsibility to kind of reassess when they're in such odd locations and, and, um, and, and how do you go back? Um, the, the Parallel Cities book that I'm going to talk about um, uh, really ties in a lot to what Eric's uh, process has been. Um, 
and I think that there, there are a lot of things that um, we kind of share as fascinations. I think the utopians, um, a lot of the social ideas of the city, um, and uh, particular authors and, and the migration of these ideas. Um, I, I think uh, the international spread was something that Eric and I talked about early on, about this kind of um, distinction between East and West, and, and this kind of lack of tracking of these ideas that uh, I think were incredibly fascinating. Um, so in, in Parallel Cities, um, which I am going to talk about as uh, the connection to Eric's book, uh, we attempt to trace an idea, the multi-level pedestrian urbanism, spanning centuries across individual authors, stylistic periods, and political economies. We investigate both the idealized and failed visions of an idea that has been a source of inspiration for visionaries hoping to perfect society and a source of concern for critics who fear the destruction of the social institution of the street. Most interesting to us had been the development and dissemination of this radical idea and its large scale and successful deployment in a range of contexts with very different cultures, rules for implementation, and larger political or social agendas underlying their use. Um, I wanted to bring up this quote by um, Bernardo Secchi. Um, the whole history of the city can be ri written keeping in mind the compatibility or incompatibility of the people. Intolerance denies proximity. It separates and creates distance between activities, buildings, public spaces, their inhabitants and users. Um, I, I'm quite interested in this, especially relative to this time, and I think relative to the work that we were doing on Parallel Cities was really about how some of the systems created segregation, um, enhanced privatization, um, how they were problematic, and then how they were actually successful. Um, that the idea of just because you're elevated doesn't mean that it's, it's necessarily an exclusionary kind of environment. It's, it's how those spaces are designed and connected. Uh, and this is one of um, uh, uh, Bernardo Secchi and Paula Vigano's projects, um, a theater plane project. And it, it shows this kind of connectivity, this kind of fluidity of space, the porosity. Um, and I think that the kinds of ideas um, in this work and, and this kind of an urbanism that's really grounded in, in social interactions are, is really rich and, and relevant right now. Um, he wrote a lot on the democratization of urban space, um, building on ideas of Henri Lefebvre and the right to the city, um, focusing on the everyday, um, and, and the idea, core idea, as he describes it, is comment vivre ensemble, how, how to live together, also the topic of the recent Venice Biennale curated by Hashem Sarkis. It's a topic focusing around the idea of proximity as it relates to spatial injustice, or ironically, in current terms, in distancing. Um, when viewed from this perspective, the way that space is designed, the tools that are available to an architect working within larger urban systems, permits or encourages particular behaviors or cultures, and supports or inhibits the social vitality or health of the city. Uh, Secchi's idea about porosity is also about locating density, about access, and about social mixing. And I think so many of these projects um, that uh, Eric is describing are really about that problem. Um, you know, um, Kenneth d described how the social project of the city ended in the 30s. Um, but I would argue that so many of these projects kind of bringing these ideas are also about the social project of the city and, and trying to, um, in more ideal terms, solve a lot of our, our larger problems, the societal problems. Um, we developed uh, an exhibition at Keller Gallery at MIT, um, Vincent and I, um, it was a key catalyst in development of parallel cities. Um, it allowed us to really map and start to look at the physical uh, artifact, as, uh, as has been discussed, of these forms, um, and, and to look at, at where they were coming. Um, uh, the following year, Eric uh, came out to our seminar. Um, w the exhibition focused on 14 cities around the world and tracking these systems. Uh, this is an image of Constance New Babylon from the Drawing Center exhibition uh, that Vince and I visited in 99. Um, 
uh, which was a number of years after I left the AA, uh, but it was um, really this kind of continuation of this fascination of the high and low forms of this kind of an urbanism. Um, our interest began with our own cities, uh, which really developed out of multi-level concepts beginning in the late 1950s, um, which was really quite early, um, and coincided with the building of Southdale and Victor Gruen's um, introduction into the area and culminating in the parallel skyway systems of Minneapolis and St. Paul, one which was private and one public, and both were informally developed. Um, we were fascinated by these systems and how they spread incrementally, um, which was very different than I think a lot of the projects that you see um, you know, in Eric's book and, and that are usually the models, um, which is somebody comes in, um, somebody with who can finance this or has political power and does it all at once. When in reality, the way that cities are, work, um, these become introduced as little mechanisms or codes or policies and then spread um, with incentives. Um, but the ideological uh, origins and resemblances to the seemingly disconnected work of Constant and Team 10 was just fa fascinating to us at that point in time. Um, so we began a process of research into the origins of the systems um, that we were living around and, and worked on maybe 20 years concurrently with our practice. Uh, I think the other part of this that was very productive to us is it actually really entered into our work and our awareness of circulation of social space and, and the kind of urbanism that architecture is. Um, seen in the montage on the left, uh, Constant Nguyen Hus's New Babylon, and on the right, the systems developed in Minneapolis, but also throughout North America. Um, uh, so where did these ideas come from? And I think we've talked about um, some obvious sources in Eric's book. Um, he, he refers to the AA and to, to Harvard, um, to Cambridge. Um, and, and that is a, a lot of the locations, but there are these other voices and protagonists um, quite often these charismatic figures, um, Rainer Banham, who visited the Walker Art Center, um, promoting uh, concepts of the clip-in and plug-in and non-plan, um, Victor Gruen's work, um, his pragmatically div driven ideas for Fort Worth uh, were generated concurrently with his work on Southdale and with his planning for St. Paul, um, which is where the idea of the Skyway actually originated, even though it wasn't built initially. Um, Ironically, these were initially idealistic as they were deployed in the, the Twin Cities um, and, and supported by people like Jane Jacobs. Um, and then the last protagonist in the area was Buckminster Fuller, whose Minnesota Experimental City Project promoted a synth more synthesized megastructural version of the multi-level city. And all of these had this really unusual crossover between planners, people who are implementing, um, and these kind of visionaries, these kind of charismatic figures who carried these ideas. Um, Uh, we were particularly interested in implementation, and this is an animation we did as part of the exhibition at MIT showing growth, um, how these megastructure-like systems began. Um, 1951 was CM8, Heart of the City. 1952 was the Minneapolis Decentralization Study. Um, Gruen opens his office, uh, begins the design of Southdale, consults on St. Paul. Um, 1954 was the Walker Art Center exhibition, Shopping Centers of Tomorrow. Um, 1956, Gruen attends Har Harvard's first urban design conference. Um, so a lot of these characters and figures kind of became part of these early development of major shifts in cities. Um, we observed in 2002 with the World Trade Center competitions the reemergence of another kind of multi-level urbanism. This form with interconnected rooftop enclaves is very different than those open networks following the datum parallel to the street level and those earlier models. Um, on the left, you have the World Trade Center with Hall, Eisenman, Guathme, and Meyer, the New York team, uh, the United team, Foreign Office, Greg Lynn, Van Berkel and Boss, Stan Allen, um, SOM and Sana in the lower uh, right, um, and Michael Molson. We were very interested in the resemblance of these projects to very particular early 20th century avant-garde forms of urbanism. Um, back to uh, Zaha Hadid and the AA and the unfinished project of construction, constructivism. 
Um, these are three Russian constructivist projects, the Vesnin Brothers and Entry for Darko, uh, GS Prom 1934, um, ABC, El Lisitsky and Mart Stam, the Wolkenbugel Project 1923 and 4, um, Melnikov's Parking Garage for Paris 1925. And what was interesting to us was that this was a different kind of an urbanism, one where architecture and infrastructure were synthesized as city. Um, uh, but still kind of exploring these forms of disengagement from the street and, and also oscillating between uh, process-oriented urbanism and something more form-oriented. Our understanding of this migration and development of ideas began with the interwar period in London. While much is made about the importation of modernism through CM, less is known about the exportation of a distinctly British set of ideas that developed prior to the famous urban proposals of Team 10 and Allison and Peter Smithson. Um, I, I developed this fascination and obsession um, and had numerous conversations with Eric about the Mars Group. Um, and, and the Mars Group is one of um, these kind of mysterious uh, influences that you can really not track because the records were destroyed in the war, um, but you can track through individuals and involvements and kind of documentation. Um, uh, this is the Mars Group's plan for London, ostensibly a radical utopian set of ideas around the multi-level city that was never implemented. Um, but what was unique about this project is not that the project was said to be done or not done. Um, multi-level urbanism was seen as a social tool. And the interest in this and the, the protagonists um, really migrated into places where they had a lot of influence. Um, 1937 to 41, um, Tatton Brown, Arthur Korn, Arthur Ling, later Percy Johnson Marshall, all connected through the Mars Group and a very small subset of the Mars Group called Town Planning um, were all major figures during Reconstruction. Korn at the AA, Ling, Tatton Brown, um, and Percy Johnson Marshall at the London County Council, um, where they started to actually deploy projects using architecture as a social tool um, using a lot of this obsession and, and um, work. Um, CM planner Patrick Abercrombie, um, although he had a different set of interests and influences, authored the Greater London Plan of 1944 and the Hong Kong Preliminary Planning Report of 1949. Both systems employed traffic separation devices, podiums and footbridges and high bridges. Abercrombie's work was really part of a larger group of architects. His employees, including Tatton Brown and Arthur Ling, both heavily were both heavily influenced by Soviet planning concepts in the early 30s and co-authors of the Mars Plan work originally. Ling wrote a book on Soviet planning um, and, and was interested in how these ideas carried forward. Um, Finding out connections and trying to understand um, w was really just by cataloging product, projects and authors um, and uh, finding narratives. Uh, we were very interested in how um, the work on the Mars Plan kind of coincided um, with publications of Russian constructivist multi-level projects and architectural review in 1937. Um, and then the, the rampant experimentation that happened later at interwar London on the multi-level city. What was most interesting is that it resulted in both speculative and built ideas that grew out of an international exchange of ideas. Uh, we, were, we were also fascinated by where did these social ideas begin? Um, and uh, really trying to trace back, um, you know, from the first moments um, of the multi-level city and and where where they were deployed as as a social solution. Um, so this this very different version of the modern multi-level city um, can be retraced in its origins to the reformist urban ideas of social utopian thinkers around the French Revolution. Charles Foyer's utopian Phalanster and the elevated street gallery as a communal space for all are arguably the beginnings of an ambition of the social project of the city explored in the early 20th century, beginning its migration as a social utopian prototype for a future city form and entering into the work of Henri Jules Bory in his Aerodomes project of the 1850s, Jules Antoine Moulin in 1869, and, and later Eugene Annard, 1889 to 1910. 
um, Charles Foyer's The Utopian Vision of 1842 proposed the street galleries as a mode of internal communication. He, he argued that enclosing and elevating uh, streets would create community, um, that you could plan a building that facilitates and redesigns society. Uh, there, there's also this long conversation about the planned versus the unplanned um, and, and the idea of the unplanned city and um, designing in terms of co components that are deployed in different ways starts to enter into this time, this time with Eugene Ennard's work in Paris in 1914. Um, there are also more rational versions of the social project of the city. Uh, as Eric refers to it in his book, uh, Michiel Brinkman's Spangen Quarter Housing Rotterdam, Netherlands, 1919, which really influenced the Smithsons um, and, and their idea of the elevated street, a, a much more rational and maybe less lyrical uh, form found in social housing afterwards. And this kind of shift between the rational and the lyrical, how these were dis either deployed as instruments, instruments of kind of efficiency or of freedom. Um, was also really fascinating. Hilbersheimer's Hochstadt, uh, 1924 to 1928, um, his sectional proposal where architecture and infrastructure are merged, a city that eliminates all speculation and ad hoc development. Um, but maybe more important than the work that was about rationalizing and planning the city was the fantastic work of the constructivists reimagining the multi-level city of Fourier. This is a concept of a floating city by Russian constructivist Laser Keitel, 1925. Um, a reason for, for doing the book that we worked on for 20 years with, or 15 years with the Walker, was because they could get us incredible images. Um, and they, they found uh, amazing stuff that we never thought we could have access to. Um, this is a design for a city on Pelotes. Uh, the Mark Narkompkin House, 1928 to 30, Mosaic Ginsburg. Um, the idea of this uh, perfect uh, house that all societal problems are resolved um, also just entered into so many different places and um, spread through academia. Um, and uh, this fascination, 1928 to 1930, um, these ideas of Soviet architecture being viewed as to tools of social changes or social condensers and inevitably focused on reimagining social spatial concepts, again, originally proposed by French social utopians. The Soviet government furthered this experimentation into these social components and their promotion through a series of competitions. While much of this work was never built, it was integral to the development and promotion of new architectural practices. Um, we became fascinated with this idea of the prototype and the idea that you could create a component, the component would spread um, as opposed to the, the uh, individual kind of architectural project. Um, Le Corbusier's time in Moscow and his plan for Moscow began to transform his practice. On the left, his Central Soyuz competition of 1928 and plan for Rio de Janeiro of 1929. So somehow of this fantastic work of multi-level urbanism started to directly transform his own work. Um, that there was a lyricism that kind of entered into his work at this time. Um, but it is still a plan, a closed logic, but prioritizes the pleasure and experience of movement and social interaction over efficiency. Um, we were also very interested in Bertolt Lubetkin, a student at Vakudimus and former employee of both Melnikov and Le Corbusier, who was very influential in importing the socially minded lyricism of movement into London architecture culture. The 30 mile plan for London's Pedway was the earliest and most ambitious multi-level system beginning in the 1940s, but it was only built incrementally until they began taking it down and now speculating on a very different form of it within London Square Mile. At that time, there was a confluence of factors that made the possibility of a radical new urban form seem tangible. Over time, the closely knit group of designers who created the Mars Group plan for London influenced from within the LCC the ideas and implementation of numerous urban projects premised on the idea of social communications and expanded it to the scale of the city. This led to the consequent appearance of spectacular and experimental urban ideas in the 1950s, directly influenced the subsequent and widespread proliferation and deployment of elevated pedestrian systems in the 1960s. <clears throat> London County Council Pedway on the left, 
and on the right, the Smithsons, who also worked for the London County Council for a short period. Um, and later, when uh, the London County Council started to uh, implement competitions, um, they used their Golden Lane housing proposal, which was unbuilt to promote and spread their idea for streets in the sky. Um, Golden Lane housing was 1952, uh, <clears throat> and Robin Hood uh, housing was 1971. So this kind of period between the early 50s and the 70s is kind of the height of the spread of these ideas. There are also important overlaps between government bureaucracies and the avant-garde. In addition to the ambitions brought to the work within government-influenced avant-garde work, Archigram members' work on London County Council projects like the South Bank influenced their more speculative project. Um, Warren Chalk, Dennis Crompton, Ron Heron, uh, worked with, at the London County Council in the early 60s. Um, concurrent, uh, Peter Cook, 1961, worked at Taylor Woodbridge. Um, this is his Piccadilly Circus proposal, but he also worked concurrently with a firm that did uh, shopping malls and these kind of more banal commercial environments that also incorporated the same ideas. <clears throat> And London County Council competitions promoted new multi-level forms and implemented them. Chamberlain, Paul and Bond, the Barbican Center in London, 1959 to 1982. Cedric Price, who also worked with the London County Council in the non-plan and the temporal, his Fun Palace project. In post-war period, this network extended to Asia, and through key figures like the Smithsons, the Metabolists, Archigram, and Cedric Price, the more prevalent ideas we know today were spread internationally in a further way. Um, there are a lot of different sources of how these ideas kind of migrated and moved, um, but the work around um, Team 10, the fascination um, with, and the development and promotion of the ideas in very particular conditions um, and the migration of ideas in interwar period of London and post-World War II, um, the migration of ideas uh, originating with the Mars Group, CM, and Team 10, including the metabolists. Um, it was fascinating just kind of uh, tracking, um, you know, people who were, London County Council is in, in blue and purple, and these are commissions and particular projects um, by the London County Council. Light blue is the AA. Uh, uh, the green um, is also London County Council projects later, um, kind of within the London County Council uh, Mars Group members designing these cities or overseeing and orchestrating. Um, and then post-war promoters of elevated systems and, and very particular um, projects that are listed that are the same kind of group of protagonists. Uh, th there's a lot of kind of connections across things. Um, cities like Hong Kong have followed a distinct trajectory since the 1960s, using multi-level urbanisms reactively to accommodate increased density and reduce congestion, pollution, and crime while promoting economic development. The same planners for London advised on the multi-level urbanism for Hong Kong. Despite the difference in context and cultures, the framework and planning principles they advocated were similar. Due to government ownership of all lands and Hong Kong's lack of a significant historic conservation agenda, the implementation of the system would be far more successful than it had been in London. What is most interesting about the Asian urban models, um, and I really enjoyed working with WashU students on, on this project, it was always interesting to me when I would have these studios um, that it was students who were primarily from Asia who took my, I don't think I had an American student who took my studio. Um, because I think the idea of uh, this, this, uh, the multi-level city in the US is a very banal idea. Um, and I think the, the models that are the Asian models are much more interesting. Um, there's much more diversity, adaptability, and integration of larger ambitions and urban systems. Um, uh, as architects and working on this project, we were also interested in how design experimentation had been implemented into the city form. One of the other trajectories that we've been interested in is how ideas are transferred from academic contexts, um, like Eric and, and his work, 
um, to the public and private realm. In Singapore, ideas were directly imported from the AA and Harvard through architects who were educated there, like William Lin, Lin Lim and Spur, as well as metabolists. Lim influenced, was influenced by Fumihiko Maki and Smithsons in his education, and Sert, as well as Gruen, um, and a student at the AA, as well as at Harvard. Um, the City in the Air proposal for Tokyo on the far left, uh, 1962, um, Arata Isozaki. Uh, in the center, Singapore, uh, uh, Will, William Lin, um, Spur's Asian City of Tomorrow, also publishing, we're promoting international pro practices um, through publications. Um, their Golden Mile project um, uh, is the, the middle and left project. Um, cities like Chongqing, um, where you have these kind of radical shifts in topography, are interesting combinations of plan and non-plan in a rapidly developing synthesized city. Um, other more recent proposal, like Stephen Hall's Link Hybrid, explore the logic of the building as prototype extended at the city of Beijing. Hall and others use the term social connectors or condensers again to describe linked bridges. The success of Singapore's design competitions um, held by the government, which promote multi-level urbanism, began to create templates for future development and also spur experimentations. On the left, uh, Woha, Woha Architects Competition for Duxton Flax Flats 2001, which then entered the city as a set of um, rules and regulations um, and recommendations. So the, the kind of knowledge built from the, the kind of experimentation cycles back into the city. Um, Woha Architects uh, Breathing City Competition on the right, Ol Sheeran's Interlace Project in Singapore. Um, Woha's reconfiguration uses three multi-level components throughout the pro complex to term Sky Park, Sky Street, and Sky Village. Um, sky parks and streets, again, are socially focused. Again, they support communal activities and are grouped um, to create vertical villages. The initial attempt at planning in the Futian district in Shenzhen and three different urban typology zones include a Team 10 influenced skyway system at the south, um, a corb influenced podium level at the north, and the, a mid connector ring. The extreme scale of podium conditions in the north in the civic and governmental area, on the right, the commercial core and its elevated bridge uh, network at the south, and in between, the scale of the OMA Urbanus proposal uh, for an elevated circulation ring. Um, OMA's uh, proposal from 2009, the Shenzhen Creative Center, um, again, organized by the government, and uh, ideas around activating social spaces and urban vitality. Um, MVRDV's 3D st Street from a similar Shenzhen competition. Um, urban planning using informal strategies. Um, urban acupuncture work ACs, Hua Quang Bei Ro project. Um, of 2009, uh, again, stitching together the multi-level urbanism as, a, as an idea about activation and, and social space. Rocker Lang Architects, Hong Kong, Shenzhen Biennale 2013 to 2014. Along with the global importation of new forms, there's also an ongoing experimentation, which I, I think um, trying to engage these and acknowledging their, their value as systems. Um, I'm going to stop here. <laughs> so, um, I, I, the last part I, I just wanted to say that I think so many of these ideas happen both at the building level and at the city level. And the idea about architecture as a form of urbanism um, both uh, shapes cities but also shapes individual projects. Um, and I think you can see that kind of through the, uh, the, the form of all of these um, different proposals and their migration. Thanks.
Yes. Yeah, good. Thanks to everybody uh, involved in this, uh, to Dean Colangelo, to Director Heather Woofter, um, Chair of Architecture, Graduate Architecture, Monica Rivera. I appreciate um, all the effort you put into this. It's really a, a great event. And also thanks to Robert McCarter for, um, for kind of being the moderator and general person to get it all off the ground. So um, it was a really very gratifying and, and I think hopefully interesting event uh, for everybody. Um, I won't try to summarize the book. <laughs> We've heard <laughs> very interestingly from, um, from various uh, previous speakers um, whose interest in the topic um, really has been significant in the book becoming what it is today. Um, also just interesting for me that in light of Ken's amazing lecture last night that um, my last public lecture before the pandemic was in Sao Paulo and this was one of the last pictures I took before the uh, the pandemic started so there's a certain interesting uh, kind of before and after aspect and I think this project also which is not very well known it isn't in the book but really does illustrate a lot of the ideas about the importance of um, the pedestrian civic center and the kind of integration of nature technology uh, in an urban environment so in writing a, a book like this um, it obviously comes out of a lot of previous uh, experience in education, certainly my own as an architect, and also the, um, the sense that a lot of students may hear in design studio about um, various aspects of architecture and urban design, but don't necessarily have a clear framework uh, in which to put that. And I think that's partly because there hasn't really been that much textbook writing uh, in recent years, there's been some effort to create global histories of architecture, which is a kind of topic for another event, really, about whether that's a valid thing to do uh, in the present. Uh, but the, even the textbooks that deal with urbanism or with um, technology tend to be from really quite a long time ago. And I think uh, Arthur Korn, who was a German CM member who um, taught at the AA, very significant uh, figure there, uh, published this book in 1955, and it basically ends in the 1940s. And so it's really quite interesting, but it it's, you know, ends a long time ago. And the um, James Marston Fitch, uh, also really worthwhile history of American building, ends uh, really in the early 60s. So th there's a whole sense that um, textbook writing aside from uh, some of the people who are here today, has not really been a major focus of the field. And I, that's, again, an, a topic for a different event about why academics tend not to take that seriously, why academic publishers tend not to fund textbooks very well, which relates to some of the issues already brought up. Um, but also, I think, in the recent decades, there's been a whole question of um, which Ken brought up of uh, too much information of sort of how do you sort through all the vast amount of information that's now available that you can do uh, web searches and use keywords you can get all kinds of information about anything uh, what's the point really of a textbook and my sense was that it was important uh, for students to be able to have a context for the material that they were looking at so if somebody talked about um, Camilo Zitta and um, they looked it up, saw that he was a Viennese educator and so on. And um, they might get some idea of his ideas, but they wouldn't necessarily, just from reading a Wikipedia article, really be able to understand the importance of Zitta uh, to the development of modern urbanism. That's just one example. But so it was really a, an effort to kind of set down a lot of the information that I had been taught in various contexts as an undergraduate in the 70s and as an architecture student, that um, at that time there was, of course, no internet. And so a lot of how we learned things were through these uh, synthetic uh, articles, uh, things that would appear in journals like Oppositions, or in this case, Lotus, um, which would tell, you know, in a very clear and concise kind of way uh, about various directions in the field that were going on. Not necessarily in a unitary way, it wasn't a kind of propaganda uh, effort, but really about uh, different positions that were being taken, whether it was Colin Rowe uh, or people like uh, Ken Frampton or Richard Plunt's versus uh, postmodernism. But these were the kinds of um, debates that people in design schools were very aware of, and there were texts that you could refer to. And so somehow to create more of an atmosphere and environment where that could occur uh, was part of the intent of writing the textbook. And it's really gratifying to see that that's sort of working in a way that in different schools, people are, are seeing relevance to it without it necessarily being some kind of last word. I guess I am a little bit, um, and partly because of my own education, doubtful about um, big master narratives and didactic uh, kinds of efforts. And that's, again, something we need to talk about uh, in the um, 
in the discussion. Um, certainly, I've been strongly uh, shaped by people like Alan Cahoon, who uh, was my advisor at Princeton back in the early 90s, who I had originally, as an architect coming to Princeton from New York, had uh, said to Alan, I was interested in writing a history of 20th century urbanism. And he thought this was a great idea. And then I went to one of my other advisors, Mary McLeod at, at Columbia, where she still is today, who was like, oh, no, no, that's much too big a topic. You really have to focus in on something more specific. And so out of those discussions, the idea of writing a history of Siam emerged, which, thanks to Mary's uh, guidance, was, you know, it's turned out much more successfully than I would have thought at the time, or certainly seemed to be at the time in, in that Princeton uh, atmosphere. So um, all of that, of course, has shaped my own education, but also uh, thinking, as everybody has been, I think, over the last few decades about global urban development, its impact on the environment, um, an interest in kind of um, looking back historically, not necessarily to praise or damn Constantinos Doxiatis, for example, and his whole effort to de develop a science of echistics of human settlements, uh, but to look back at that historically and to think about how, what kind of history is relevant uh, in the ongoing debates about uh, urbanism, sustainability. Some people today would say urbanism isn't the right term, uh, just to give a kind of historical genealogy of that as part of the intent of the book. It's a term that really has its roots in the ancient uh, Latin word, which refers to the physical form of the city something that Igor alluded to, that's his focus on artifacts, on the built or artifactual aspect of the city, uh, which is different for the ancient Romans from the civitas, the urban community. And even today, there's often, I think, a certain confusion about those, um, about those terms in terms of talking about cities. Are we talking about the human community of a city or are we talking about the physical form of the city? And my work is always focused on the physical form of the city, but inevitably, as you try to describe that, or in some ways talk about a designer's role in shaping it, you can't avoid talking about social and economic developments. I mean, Doxiatis's work probably wouldn't even be possible today as a European architect working extensively uh, in Africa and the Middle East. And that seems to me to be something that we need to think about in some way uh, as we try to develop these discourses. There's also the whole question of the architect's perspective. Um, some of my other research has been on uh, Charles Fleming, a local architect here, working with Chantel Blakely. Uh, architects do see uh, urbanism in very particular ways and often make very substantial impacts on the built environment. And how to think about that historically has been part of the intent uh, of, of this project, which is not at all intended to reinforce any kind of uh, racial narratives of any particular kind, but really try to look realistically at what happens. And when, when one does that, one does find uh, that race in the United States, at least, has been a very shaping force in how cities have been organized. This whole question of a beautiful quote from Bernardo Secchi about uh, that uh, patterns of separation are really an aspect of urbanism, and they have to do with intolerance, really, an unwillingness of uh, various groups to uh, live amongst others. So all that part of the, um, the intent of the book, it's really has a lot of familiar material, I think, for anyone who <laughs> knows anything about the topic. But I, I find in teaching it's really quite useful to be able to say, you know, look at the 19th century chapter and you can understand Haussmann's Paris, which remains actually, despite its extremely unequal patterns, which in some ways continue today, very successful example of pedestrian urbanism, that it's really quite a remarkable, walkable uh, city on a very large scale with all kinds of historical layering to it, uh, unfortunately not necessarily available uh, to the mass of people that live in the periphery of Paris, kind of issues that Ken was alluding to last night, that may be a sort of paradigmatic condition really for world cities uh, generally. The other issue that I think also is, is relevant or important uh, to urbanism is this whole question of, of transportation and where rail is not something that was with uh, part of human culture forever. It really has a very specific history, which is worth paying attention to. Uh, begins uh, in the 19th century, mostly in England and the east coast of the US, very rapidly spreads uh, to a lot of other uh, places and environments, but in unequal ways, that there's not necessarily the same uh, railway history or railway cities uh, in all parts of the world. And that having a very shaping effect, I think, on 19th century culture and also on a lot of, of course, military outcomes, the Civil War being a notable example. And so this whole sort of way of architects thinking about mass transit may need to be uh, in some ways uh, maybe just more historically informed, not necessarily rejecting the possibilities of it, but recognizing that cities like this one, like St. Louis, actually originated in a railway context and it was the fourth 
fourth largest city in the country when it was a major rail center as the earlier had been a major river center. And so that's, again, part of the intent of the book is just to make more awareness about that and also about the, um, the possibility that technology offered to escape from the center of the city, uh, from industry, from what were then very smoky and unsanitary environments uh, into more bucolic surroundings, which until the 20th century were only available to very wealthy people, uh, that the ideal suburbs like Olmsted's Riverside which still exists, is still quite successful outside of Chicago, uh, that these uh, kind of environments are not necessarily something that just happens naturally or normatively, but are the later efforts to make those more widely available in a rather imperfect way, and certainly segregated way in the United States, uh, that these kinds of environments required a lot of uh, deliberate planning, deliberate thinking. Some of it still may be admirable today in terms of, for example, at Riverside preserving the Des Plaines River as a series of uh, park, parks along the river, a uh, very early example of sort of ecological planning, but at the same time very much exclusionary, basically limiting uh, these uh, kind of opportunities for health and nature uh, to um, a segment of the population that was capable of affording these kinds of houses and was also seen as, suit as a suitable kind of people uh, to be living there. And so those issues are still very, very much with us. And I think giving those a kind of historical genealogy uh, is important, uh, even for thinking about a lot of issues today in these metropolitan environments like Houston or St. Louis or Minneapolis. Um, other aspects of the book also cover the City Beautiful movement, which has left major uh, impacts, things like uh, Burnham's Plan of Chicago, the whole effort to reconstruct uh, Chicago rather successfully. One should say that sometimes people have this idea that in the United States, urban planning was never really successful, that there wasn't the kind of authoritarian, uh, top-down uh, kind of uh, environment that one might have found in European cities in the 19th century. But actually, um, there's really quite a consensus among commercial elites in the early 20th century to make these massive changes which have deeply uh, transformed cities like Chicago with its waterfront, uh, its successful cultural institutions, uh, the way that uh, things like the University of Chicago exist in this whole kind of special uh, district which only goes back to the 1890s and was completely racially <laughs> segregated until the 1940s. That all of this has left a major impact uh, on cities around the world, much of it inspired by American directors of the early 20th century. And so that also part of why I thought the book was helpful to begin to situate that not as it had been really in the 90s as a kind of nostalgic point of return where uh, a lot of people in Chicago especially were, became very committed new urbanists and really saw the Burnham era as a point of reference, but instead to think about it really as a historical episode with both positive and negative uh, outcomes. It involved um, reorganizing the rail circuits, for example, of Chicago in a successful way, uh, creating these public institutions, many of which are still valued uh, in the present, but at the same time uh, shaping the city in a certain kind of way uh, that has impacts that are still uh, felt today. I also wanted to include uh, some of, something about the history of technology generally, that before we get into a lot of the material which is maybe more relevant today in terms of elevated streets or uh, thinking about uh, the auto-based metropolis, there is a whole history of high-rise building, most of which originates in New York and Chicago and then has worldwide uh, sorts of impacts. And that seems especially important if you visit, as I was fortunate to do, uh, East Asia a number of times in the last 15 years, you can see the massive impact of ideas that in the United States may not really have all that much uh, current appeal, an occasional high-rise tower here and there, um, whereas it's really the sh main urban form of a lot of cities that are just now being produced or have been produced in the last few decades. And so giving some kind of history to that uh, seemed important, both for positive reasons to understand you know, what these technologies are, what they do, uh, but also, you know, that there are negative downsides to uh, this form of development, which are only maybe now uh, becoming part of the discourse uh, in East Asia. And again, all of these environments, settings for um, social change, for uh, economic uh, transformations, so the rise of trade unions, uh, efforts to finally give women the right to vote in 1919, and also ongoing conflicts uh, around race, which very sadly are still going on uh, today, but uh, something that is also part of uh, not just the uh, social history, but also there's a whole physical framework uh, to this, to these kinds of um, uh, social development, social uh, protests, which sometimes has physical outcomes, sometimes is not. 
One that I think does uh, seem relevant uh, is this whole question of affordability in housing, how housing can in some way uh, be a positive force in the city, not simply an instrument of financial speculation. I'm personally quite interested in these 19th century uh, housing developments where really following on these foyerist ideas about interconnected streets, open galleries, uh, how you begin to uh, figure out ways that people can live very densely uh, together in some relatively uh, socially consensus-based kind of way, and at the same time provide for light and air, ventilation, places for recreation. Really the key driving impulse behind later avant-garde movements like Siam uh, starting in the 1920s. And so that's also part of the book, how that develops into tenement reform, very limited impacts in New York City, uh, really though it does lay the basis for building regulation beginning in the late 1870s and uh, producing um, the kinds of urban environments that you still find. Uh, the 1901 New York tenement law, really the model then for apartment legislation in a lot of other cities in the US, uh, just as an example. Um, and then also continuing that story into uh, reform housing, what becomes uh, public housing in the 1930s, uh, all of it racially segregated, but sometimes rising to a relatively high level of, um, of design, Harlem River houses, I think still an interesting perimeter block uh, model in Harlem from the early 30s, one of the first projects of the New York City Housing Authority. Many of the later projects, not nearly as, um, as successful as that. Um, and then also all of that happening, trying to think about the whole question of the automobile, really, again, the United States leading the way in the 19-teens with Henry Ford, how the automobile becomes a transformative instrument of metropolitan development, how the highway begins to supplant uh, the railway. At first, highways modeled after commuter railways in Westchester County in the early 1920s, and then uh, to the surprise of their builders, uh, they, fi they find that people aren't just using them for weekend recreation, but they're becoming major uh, commuter routes and very quickly overburdened, as they still are with traffic. Uh, all of that uh, then leading to further efforts to replan metro regions. New York, again, I think one of the main places where that happens very early uh, with an idea of circuits of highways around the city, things like the George Washington Bridge and later uh, the tunnels, uh, actually even earlier, the Lincoln Tunnel and the, Hol the Holland Tunnel even earlier, uh, that all of these begin to um, transform how people actually inhabit uh, these kinds of environments in ways that are actually the object of planning in the 1920s, not government planning, but planning funded by real estate and uh, ins especially insurance companies that were concerned about losing their investment uh, if um, unrestricted development of a 19th century kind with a lot of tenements and pollution uh, continue to happen. And so that's really where the zoning then, which I write about in the book, becomes a really major aspect of how cities uh, are regulated and in a sense planned, even though there's no overt uh, necessarily planning intention uh, behind a zoning ordinance. All of this also theorized and theories that are very auto-based, but interesting uh, to think about today, the Regional Planning Association of, of America in the 1920s, um, Lewis Mumford, a key figure in that, and I'm not related to Lewis Mumford, I should say, just for the record, <laughs> even though I've known his work most of my life. Um, and also Henry Wright, a partner of Clarence Stein. Henry Wright, actually a landscape architect educated at Penn, who worked here in St. Louis, designing some of the neighborhoods uh, right near the campus uh, off of Wydon Boulevard. And then as a member of the RP, PAA uh, becoming someone who, uh, for a very early point, proposed um, regionalist ideas based on Lewis Mumford's theory that the U.S. was undergoing what was called a fourth migration in the 1920s, that he traced out these earlier periods of basically white uh, settlement, and then uh, beginning uh, in the 20th century, he saw this concentration in large cities, large financial centers, uh, all of them with the Federal, Federal Reserve Bank, that's what the 12 sub-metropolises refers to there, and um, that he thought that the next stage would be uh, the move to more decentralized urban regions uh, based on hydroelectric power and automobiles. And so that uh, really prompting Henry Wright's influential New York State Plan of 1925, which wasn't immediately carried out, but ultimately shaped uh, the location of the New York State Thruway, uh, setting aside large areas as nature preserves in the Catskills and the Adirondacks, and um, basically prompting a whole way of thinking that then ultimately led to the TVA, the Tennessee Valley Authority, uh, in the 1930s during the New Deal, where similar ideas were applied to an even larger region uh, in the Tennessee Valley watershed. And so uh, this kind of turn, I think, is important to understand because it occurs at the same point uh, that 
uh, existing real estate practices start to become uh, institutionalized through federal efforts to uh, determine which neighborhoods are risky for uh, mortgage insurance, so what leads to the practice known as redlining, uh, neighborhoods shown in red on these maps, which were available to real estate lenders, uh, were areas that were considered too risky for um, federal mortgage insurance, and thus basically deprived of capital. Uh, thereafter, those were always neighborhoods with more than 50% non-white population, and also neighborhoods that were older, had low rents, and the buildings uh, were observed to not be in good repair. And so that having a really shaping impact then uh, on many cities, certainly St. Louis, often known as a place in some of these practices developing from the planning of Harlem Bartholomew here, uh, but also every other city, major city in the country, similarly uh, redlined in, in a similar way. And you can certainly see those impacts in places like Detroit. So it's not planning in the sense of being done by planners, but ultimately has a huge impact. Something that I think is interesting to try to think about that in relation to the kinds of avant-garde urbanism that we've been talking about, which has this more positive uh, social uh, aspiration, which attempts in some way uh, to continue the project of early modernism, no longer in uh, the sort of Soviet context, which, as Ken mentioned, <laughs> becomes impossible after 1931 uh, for architects, but nonetheless uh, to continue some of the social intentions uh, of that work. And there, of course, the story becomes complex and in some ways more familiar. Um, the whole approach of Le Corbusier in the 30s, as we've already heard, and even seen some of the many outcomes of that, uh, then becoming an important part of, this, of the history of urbanism, I think. Uh, all of it actually relating uh, to the history of CM as well. Um, not every CM housing project was a disaster. Uh, and there was also a very strong effort uh, to incorporate uh, the natural environment at a pretty early point uh, in many of these projects, that the intents were not only about um, the existence minimum as a kind of economic uh, way of building, which was part of it, but also uh, relating uh, human inhabitation uh, to what was broadly called recreation, but certainly included uh, the natural environment. And so that, I think, is a strand that needs to be more b better understood in the history of urbanism, something that uh, tends to be uh, kind of overwhelmed by the negative story of American public housing, uh, but is something that really um, I have always felt uh, needed to be better known. And so the book is also partly intended uh, to do that. And there are many, of course, examples, a lot of key figures, uh, Le Corbusier, but also Alto and others, uh, their work uh, developing very directly out of those directions uh, in CM in the early 30s. What we tend to know instead uh, are the American examples. Um, again, not only public housing, but also insurance company housing, racially segregated, um, often supported very strongly by city administrations. It saw opportunity for a lot of jobs uh, which existed in these projects, uh, but nonetheless um, very reductively segregating the city and producing a pattern of building, which I think you can argue in some ways still goes on. It's really not at all about uh, the tectonic or the natural world, but simply about maximizing profit from a certain amount of square footage uh, in a way that seems very hard to change, that seems to have a kind of logic about it um, that we can see even examples here in St. Louis, uh, of this kind of maximizing of profit uh, and total disregard really for all these other uh, kinds of factors. And so the book is in some ways an effort uh, to call attention really to how uh, architects have not only unsuccessfully but also successfully managed in some cases uh, to address these issues and how those have had a worldwide impact. We've heard, we're hearing about how British planners had a big impact on um, Hong Kong in 1949 and that also includes public housing where a lot of the London County Council housing uh, practices come directly into Hong Kong and then not long after into Singapore, uh, setting patterns for East Asia that if, again, if you go to East Asia, you can't avoid uh, the m just tremendous number of these kinds of projects, which are really a normative form of middle-class housing, which very likely is more like more to be the future of urbanism than something like a Levittown uh, two-bedroom house. And so th the implications of that, I think, still need to be much more seriously uh, thought about than they have been uh, to date. Again, we tend to, maybe inevitably and maybe necessarily, certainly in this city, go back to uh, these kind of negative uh, moments uh, in the 1950s, the sort of effort to remove whole populations uh, where they had been living for decades, demolish institutions, um, and the, so that the positive aspects of public housing are pretty difficult to talk about here, uh, certainly in these neighborhoods, but, um, but it is something that isn't the, necessarily the whole story, that there are other aspects 
uh, to how architects have approached uh, the design of cities. Their intent was not necessarily uh, to eradicate uh, populations, although unquestionably that was uh, the outcome, certainly in the Mill Creek Valley here, uh, which I studied in another context. So much of the book also then building on my own uh, research on Siam, particularly post-war Siam, uh, figures that maybe aren't as well known as um, Le Corbusier, but people like Sir Ernesto Rogers, um, a lot of that happening at the same time as the uh, redevelopment of center cities, uh, the firms like Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill starting to shape uh, the design of skyscrapers in what was then a radically new way. So uh, an intent in there also to kind of um, bring in some of the discourses that those of us in architectural education know about uh, and also uh, efforts to really think about the city as an existing context, something that becomes hugely influential, maybe not always in a good way, by the 1970s and 1980s. It's good, I think, that there's now some scholarship uh, on Rogers in English. For years, you had to read Italian to learn anything about Ernesto Rogers. And finally, uh, our colleague Maurizio Sabini at Drury here in Missouri uh, has published this book on Rogers. He's an Italian architect who also edits the journal uh, The Plan. And so, um, and again, Ken uh, writing the introduction there. And it's uh, worthwhile, really, I think, to get a sense of Rogers as someone who really began to um, continue, both continue and question some of the earlier aspects of CM modernism uh, in ways that I think were very influential on people like Charles Moore and a whole generation of American uh, architects uh, really from the 1960s forward. I've also done a lot of research on CERT. Some of that's in the book. There are a lot of other uh, places you can learn about uh, CERT's work. Unfortunately, which still exists, uh, the Harvard University administration has not demolished these buildings, as has happened similar buildings on other campuses. Um, and so they are still available in a way uh, to go look at. I also I thought it's important to understand that CERT was not simply a campus architect, but also someone who uh, prompted a whole discipline, really, of urban design, beginning with the first Harvard Urban Design Conference in 1956. People who taught there and studied there at that time, developing influential approaches to low-rise, high-density housing, um, this idea that you could use uh, digital technology, computers, to, um, to think about how to organize urban patterns, urban settlements, already really being done by Chermayev and Alexander in the late 50s, published in 1963, um, really, I think, anticipating a lot of the challenges for the future in thinking about how um, higher density settlements can be laid out without becoming negative environments, which many people in metro areas still tend to associate high density uh, with bad social and sanitary outcomes. Uh, and also then we've talked a lot about, I won't try to overlap Jennifer's talk here in talking about um, the parallel cities, this whole issue of the streets in the air, the Smithsons, Team 10, um, all of that, interestingly, I think, connected to Louis Kahn's ideas, uh, Robert has extensively uh, written about, and um, how all these things become the basis then for different ways of thinking about the city, some of which are still current uh, in the 1960s, and how those are also then challenged by uh, situationism, by radical efforts to disrupt um, the sort of social order, the hope of producing a more revolutionary future society, uh, much of that uh, influential for a time on the sort of neo-avant-garde, although I think today we can maybe say that's kind of over too, um, but that certainly was a, um, a whole kind of theoretical discourse um, centered on people like Mark Wigley and others uh, for a number of decades. Um, so all of that, I think, important for students to understand, to know about in a relatively concise way, movements like Archigram that we've already heard about, uh, but also people like Fumihiko Maki, who I'm currently uh, working on an issue for um, the Japanese magazine A Plus U on his um, idea of group form, which he developed when teaching here. Uh, his first building, Steinberg Hall, is just across the plaza uh, from 1960. And uh, while he was a young professor, here, he developed this idea of a group form, which was an intent really to think beyond megastructure. That uh, while megastructure was at that moment uh, becoming a major form of um, urbanism, uh, the idea of group form is instead that it doesn't rely so much on a centralized uh, architect or centralized administration, but really is about uh, kind of continuing the patterns of vernacular villages uh, where the buildings themselves can change and are frequently altered over time, but the overall urban image uh, remains the same and the basic uh, kind of pedestrian uh, infrastructure, or even vehicular infrastructure, remains uh, constant over time because it costs a lot of money to build that, but other aspects uh, can change and grow. And so, to me, it's still an interesting idea. Some of this end of the campus is designed along uh, similar lines, and so um, I think it's still a productive idea uh, to think about. And you can see one outcome in Sert's work, who uh, 
former student Maki uh, basically influencing Sturt in the design of Peabody Terrace uh, at Harvard and student dormitory where uh, you see this effort to create a kind of urban infrastructure that could really continue that of course in Cambridge there are historic neighborhoods around it but for Sir this was the, the idea of a first step uh, toward a kind of urbanism that could um, be applied in a lot of other circumstances and in some cases has been although not nearly uh, to the extent that uh, CERT had hoped to uh, in the 1960s and 70s uh, and various outcomes also of low-rise high density related ideas related to urban design the Previ uh, complex in Lima here I also tried to bring in the whole issue of self-build a lot of it uh, really a based on the work of my friend Sharif Kahat at, uh, in Lima, who uh, unfortunately his book has not been translated into English, but it's a really quite interesting history of modern housing in Lima and how at a certain point by the 60s it was realized that the more formal sector housing was simply too expensive for a lot of the urban population. That was quite different than Sao Paulo in that way, which has a much larger middle class. And so uh, the whole effort then turned toward trying to uh, somehow structure uh, the whole process of self-build, which goes back to the late 40s there, where groups of people coming in from the countryside, often associated with the Peruvian military, uh, would take over a piece of land and, uh, and then begin to build uh, in what was actually a fairly standard and traditional way of courtyard houses, some of which have roots uh, in the pre-Spanish uh, conquest period and certainly continued then uh, through the colonial era in Peru. And so um, how that could then maybe be the basis for a new kind of urbanism, uh, beginning in the late 60s, Peter Land, an English architect uh, who had studied uh, with CERT and later taught at IIT, unfortunately just died a few years ago, uh, he oversaw the master plan for Previ where various architects were invited in, uh, many of them quite famous, uh, to design different projects which would then be built uh, by the people living there. Quite interestingly, a lot of the projects have been altered over time and so that there's not uh, necessarily too much trace of, for example, Maki's uh, original project, just the kind of basic lot uh, is there and it's been altered and added onto uh, and many of the other projects are like that. Sterling's actually, interestingly, hasn't been changed as much and there's a few others there uh, that are closer to the original design. But it's a, um, an interesting, I think, example of trying to uh, somehow engage this whole issue of the informal settlement uh, and what, what is the role of designer, something that's really, I think, needs to be thought about as I write about uh, in the book some as well. But as we've heard and as we know, against that, uh, by the late 70s, uh, early 80s, uh, a whole postmodernist direction, much of it deriving from the work of Venturi and Scott Brown, uh, also based on close observation, really, of the American urban environment, trying to think in a different way about what is the role of architecture uh, in these extremely commodified environments, one uh, where they identify the signage as really the main architectural element, uh, the rest of the um, casino environments or other kinds of uh, resort type uh, facilities, basically not um, really the subject of much architecture, very pragmatically conceptualized. And so uh, that too, I think it should be part of the history of urbanism, whatever we, whatever positions we may have taken about that over the years. I've never been any big fan <laughs> of Venturi and Scott Brown in that sense, but um, I think it's a um, important part now, historically, this is over 50 years ago, uh, learning from Las Vegas studio. and. Um, certainly very influential on Noam Kulhas, many other architects since then. And then against that also registering the importance of critical regionalism, um, the idea of taking a different stance uh, in relationship uh, to um, increasing commodification and basically post, what we now call postmodernist directions, uh, trying to think through in some way uh, how some of these approaches might have relevance uh, even back in Europe itself as in the work of CESA and others. But I think we have to recognize that much of that not that successful in terms of the mainstream uh, development of urbanism. And then here again, I think uh, the Chinese example, Pudong, uh, from the early 90s and its many uh, successors around China, around the world, uh, really worth thinking about historically now. Again, whatever we might think about them as original decisions, uh, they're now the historic fabric, in a sense, of, of many cities and will remain so probably uh, for a long time. So without going any further, I think that's enough of a summary. Um, certainly, uh, saying that all this, I appreciate Heather's comments, all this very much developing out of a particular St. Louis context where we've really tried many, many different ways over the years uh, to engage this very difficult problem of the segregated and declining city, the city that continues to lose population. How do we think about that? And I think knowing something about the history of urbanism generally, I hope, uh, is helpful. So I think I'll just uh, end it there.
subject up to the up to the front. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to, and, and some, some concern to um, try to moderate a discussion that encompasses what was effectively a, a two and a half hour master class in urbanism and the history of urbanism and the history of the attempts to design the urban realm um, with, with many, um, many stories that, um, that I hope we can elicit further discussion. I do want to, I want to begin by um, recognizing that, that Eric's book is um, deceptively thin, I would say. I mean, it, it, I mean, he was able to read most of it this morning, so he said, so, um, or since he got up, which I don't know if that, I assume that was the morning, but um, uh, on the other hand, uh, when I tried to make notes, I, I just gave up after about the first 10 pages because I was just underlining everything. So if you, if you read a book and you underline everything, I think you just have to sort of give up on the notion that you're going to make a synopsis of what's clearly uh, <laughs> the densest possible synopsis. So I did want to, I wanted to reference a couple of things. One is I want to pick up on Igor's um, statement at the end of his presentation, which is to some, to, I think it was something like, to look ahead, you need to look back. Um, and I, of course, Eric's book, I think, is a extraordinary example. It also reminded me of something that I'd, a quote that was given to me just recently in an email exchange of Olus Blomstedt, who was one of the leading uh, rational architects of Finland uh, as a kind of counterpoint to Aalto's uh, humanism, which is, if you wish to create something new, study that which is ancient. Um, and so what I, was, what I would like to do to keep the focus, at least my focus, on Eric's book is to th give you three uh, contrasts that I found in my reading, or sort of conflicts, and three parallels and, uh, as drawn from the book. And I'll start with the conflicts. Um, and one of them is actually quite personal because uh, in, in describing the development of CIM diagrams um, from the block to the housing bar, um, the evolution of modernism was determined that the perimeter block, which is the most common building type in dense cities such as Amsterdam and other places, was unsatisfactory as an intermediate stage in the, in the steady march towards the Zalimbau. Um, and uh, I have to now say that as a student in the, my second year at Columbia, I took the housing studio under Kenneth Frampton and we did perimeter blocks, So, uh, which was the sort of party that was determined uh, as one of the three mixes of housing that we uh, explored as a housing studio. Um, the second is uh, a sort of double-edged one. One, it has to do with the notion of Milton Keynes, the new town, and how the streets were attempting to replicate a kind of auto-focused or autopic um, aspects, which were praised by Rainer Banham, but also very influenced by Melvin Weber's notion of the non-place urban realm which has to be the exact polar opposite of what Kenneth talked about last night, which is the space of public appearance as it's uh, presented by Hannah Arendt. And um, I found that to have a parallel with uh, the work of Victor Gruen and, and Gordon Cullen as described by Eric, which is rather than making urban places for political assembly, their new, new focus is on a pedestrian space is to create a kind of gen experience and that somehow phenomenology is put against politics in an interesting way in that juxtaposition. And the, and the third conflict is, is really more my sort of concern. I remember a presentation that David Chipperfield gave in the 1990s when he was first working in Davenport on the museum that he would eventually build there. He, he started the lecture by showing us uh, this was in F Florida to a state 
conference of architects, showed aerial views of Davenport, which of course showed that 30% of the city was buildings and 70% of it was streets and parking. And he said, you have to understand as a European, when I see a photograph like this, which is Davenport today, I see war damage. Mm -hmm. But what I have to recognize is that you did this to yourselves because Eric showed one slide just recently about the whole area of St. Louis that was completely erased. So there's this huge gap as if somehow there was something there that we should never build on, but in fact it was built on. So um, I, I just, I find this oxymoronic term urban renewal which I'm not sure exactly who it's renewed for and what, what is, I don't even think the term renewal uh, has, a, has relevance here. So in terms of the three uh, parallels or maybe more positive things, I was struck by the fact that almost from the very beginning of the book, in fact in the discussion of London of all places, um, Eric mentions this, this continual c concern and return to the idea of a city as structured to walking distance and to the pedestrian experience and of course this is repeatedly returned to in the work of Sert uh, and, the, and the, uh, the idea of the heart of the city. And then, uh, of course, maybe not in as progressive uh, 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 a way in the, in the recent new urbanist discussions, which actually just repeat certain uh, ideas about low density housing that Franco Wright developed in, in 1900 in his proposals for the new developments outside of Chicago. Um, the second has to do uh, with, uh, Eric mentions O'Gorman doing the schools as a, the new schools in Mexico City in 1932 and that how that parallels Clarence, Tom, Clarence, Clarence Perry and the idea that schools at that time were conceived as natural community centers and they should be a place where everyone focuses their work and it's not as well known in the U.S. but actually in, that's actually government policy in the Netherlands right now. For every building, every uh, school that Herman Hertzberger builds has at least 10 programs which runs the gamut uh, from police stations through three or four different schools, libraries, uh, health clinics, uh, community centers, meeting rooms, uh, just about everything that doesn't fit into most new uh, housing developments. Um, and then uh, for me, most interestingly, is, and ties back a little bit to the idea about learning from the past, is, is the discussion of um, some a thinker like Saverio Muratori from the University of Rome, um, who documented the historic structures of uh, Rome and Venice. In fact, I have a couple of his little books that I bought when I was living in Italy in the 80s. Um, and uh, what he was seeking for was what he said was, uh, what in history resists change? What is it that, despite all of the changes in uh, economy and, and, and lifestyles and everything else, what is it that exists in a city that can resist that change and, and therefore keep this sense of place? And the historical building types, he felt, uh, were a kind of a priori synthesis of use and form that allows such types to logically uh, connect urban fabric, street, and topography. And this is a sort of line of thinking that, that uh, connects Ernesto Roger to Muratori, and then of course to someone like Aldo Rossi who re reintroduced some of these ideas. And I, I find, um, I too am very glad that, uh, even though I read enough Italian that I can read Ernesto Rogers, I'm very glad to have a, a reasonably better translation than I can make um, in my own stumbling way of, of some of Rogers' thinking because all of his uh, writings have been published in uh, Italian for some time and actually quite well curated. So um, those are those are some some things that I noted in my reading, which I don't know that they completely duplicate some of the other ideas that were were brought forward. But I thought I would put those out, and then I think between that and everything else that we have heard, we have we have plenty to do for the next hour. Uh, so I, I turn it over to my colleagues here. I, I, if anyone would like to start. Besides Eric, I guess he gets to have he gets to have a later word. But Kenneth's been making a lot of notes since he made his presentation. So, is it, is it fair to call on you? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Going, isn't it? Okay. Yes. Um, well, there's so much material, but vis-a-vis, um, uh, -vis, you know, auto destruction. I mean, um, David Chipperfield and. Uh, you know, the cities were not bombed, you know. And it's also an experience I had in the mid-60s of uh, 
I, I don't know, coming to, well, Philadelphia, for example, or also parts of New York, and uh, you know, the, because coming out of the British scene, you know, and therefore out of London, and with still vacant sites all over the place, which were bomb sites, in fact, you know, so that you know somehow second nature was to read it like that, and therefore coming to American City and finding the, the similar kind of phenomena, but then having to wake up to the fact that these cities had not been bombed, you know. That, so I think I understand David Chipperfield's reaction. And, uh, well, that's one thought. You covered a lot of ground uh, with, with your presentation. Um, you know, and uh, so, but the, the other thought is, you know, about uh, Gruen, for example, you know, the, the, the question of uh, shopping centers. You know, it's, it seems very clear to me that uh, and it also happened, it has happened more recently, of course, in the UK, you know, but with the same effect. That is, the automobile, suburbanization, um, speculation, and, and then shopping centers, you know. And then, of course, traditional uh, small villages, provincial cities lose their entirely, uh, you lose completely their commercial viability, you know. They, they're wiped out by, by shopping centers. So, um, and that's also very evident. I mean, you know, all, also all over the states, I think you can find that in, uh, I'm thinking in particular of Troy, New York, but it could be, uh, I mean, the, the Troy was a very urban little town, you know, with its opera house and all the rest of it. And the, sh the shopping center built outside, of course, well, it's still something left there, you know, but it's a big struggle to, to sustain its economic viability. So it brings me to another thought. I mean, I think if there is an, uh, an apocalyptical invention, I think it is for sure the automobile, you know. And, and uh, I mean, there are so many things that would, would not have happened if, if there had not been the mass ownership of the automobile. I mean, mass ownership, which, which in Europe, of course, came particularly after the Second World War, but uh, the mass ownership of the automobile would have enormous impact and, uh, and still does. I mean, in every conceivable sense, which in the last analysis also means consumption of agricultural land. And, uh, and that goes on at a huge rate. And, and, uh, and it will, of course, be a future threat, you know, because clearly given climate change, et cetera, et cetera, this question of agricultural land will at some point be, you know, a sort of desperate situation because, uh, yeah, well, starvation is, is sitting there, you know, look, looking at the, the species, you know, uh, for example. And, and so this automobile has, has had that impact. And, uh, and of course, the, right now, for example, man, Manhattan, which is sort of busily destroying itself through the combination of the automobile, but above all, of course, the elevator. And these, these two inventions are fascinating in a way in that they both were transformative. And uh, I mean, uh, unlike Sao Paulo, uh, Manhattan doesn't have a height limit at all. I mean, it's just free for all. You know, developer can do whatever they want. But it's clear that that's what's happening. There is no... There is no, actually, there is no idea of the city that this, New York City has no idea about what it is, is supposed to be anymore. It's gone, you know, completely. And, and actually, in the mid-60s, even still, there was something left of a height limit, but it's long since vanished. There are just some thoughts that are provoked by your, by the whole, actually, well, by, by the, this very interesting Yes, very dense. Uh, what, how did you describe it? I mean, <laughs> I mean, it, it's very, very stimulating. And and uh, and Eric, uh, with illustrations that I suppose he would like to have had in the book reproduced. <laughs> you know, you know. Uh, uh, I mean, unbelievable illustrations like, uh, uh, you know, this beautiful plan, which has to be, re after all, reproduced in color of of. Uh, of Burnham's plan for Chicago, you know, just, 
or the 1870, that incredible thing I've never seen before, the 1870 map of the rail system, you know. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, th these things are, are really amazing. And of course, m it makes me think of something else, because I think that, uh, you know, in, uh, in LA, uh, well, the LA, in t in which was the LA of Richard Neutcher's emerging career as an architect, was had an extensive electric rail system, all of which was torn out yep. and, and uh, to make uh, auto routes and God knows what, right? To, uh, so this auto destruction, you here playing with auto and automobile, is, is you know, it's, it's something else really, it's just amazing. And uh, anyway, just some thoughts. It's interesting that you bring that up, but we discussed this a little bit at dinner last night, that uh, the, the paucity of things that we're allowed to put in the books versus, and Eric was just Soto Bochi talking to me about it earlier, versus the enormous, I, I don't really want to call it a wealth, but anyway, there's a, uh, because I think some of it is actually uh, not what it purports to be, but the, the number of images that you can get if you just Google something. All of them say it's a certain thing, but as I've warned my students, you know, there is Renzo piano work that is uh, actually attributed to Norman Foster, et cetera, which they find problematic, but uh, maybe the students don't. But the, the idea that you, it's uncurated, completely uncurated, unedited kind of dump of images, if you do any of these projects that we've referenced today, um, and yet they, they don't come with the narrative as you discussed, they don't, they don't uh, come with the, pluses and minuses that were discussed in the presentations, you know, the sort of good, bad, and ugly maybe that one it should be able to, because nothing is an ideal that works perfectly and nothing is a, a total failure in that you can't learn something from it. And um, it's a little bit like working in the studio, but uh, you in the studio you have a limited number of images being generated off the desk of the students versus the kind of, uh, if you just try to grapple with a, a tip of, some of the issues that are brought forward in the book. And I, I think uh, th that's one of the difficulties with thinking about trying to write a comprehensive account of anything. I've always actually been a big fan of writing a single building monograph because I think it allows you to penetrate in not <coughs> only to the design, but even uh, to the occupancy and to the sort of uh, the, uh, what is the building like you know, 50 years, 100 years later or whatever. And um, if you have that kind of time span available uh, because of the life of the building, but we also have to deal with sort of principles. How do you how do you act? You can't have a monograph on every every condition in which you work. And so I think uh, the merit of, of of books like Eric's uh, are give us a roadmap. I think, and he references a lot more projects than he's allowed to illustrate. He, because you know, it, uh, for many years I used to buy Italian texts when I lived there. They were first off they'd be like five dollars for a book that thick, but then it had zillions of images, which I have no idea where they got. And they certainly didn't get the, uh, they never got the copyrights and all that. And they're all these they're not particularly beautiful reproductions, but it, they're incredible if you just want to get plans yeah. of, of thousands of buildings. They, I still have them. They're incredible source books. Um, and now, of course, the students can do that online, but it's not curated. No one, no one is curating it, and so I think that's a that's a serious issue. Yeah, I, I think that there's a lot of scope for eBooks, and some of the publishers like Yale are starting to move into that now. That I think that um, you know everybody students now mostly assume that they'll get information from the internet, not from books in the library, and so it's really a, a kind of um, conceptual challenge about how to how to approach that. Um, because I think in, in in effect the Wikipedia becomes the source of information, and you know it, it has a lot of images. <laughs> you don't know if they're you know where they come from, if they're you know really accurately labeled and so on. And so I think that's a, that's a real area to think about for academic research and in architectural and urban history especially because there's so much data, and there you need to have ways to interpret it. And often there's a resistance to doing that because there's a sense that you're just going to be imposing the same narrative on it. And it's always going to be about Franklin Wright and Le Corbusier and, you know, what about, you know, these other histories. But often when you look closely at those histories, 
you find there's a lot of intersections and overlaps. I mean, certainly the New Deal is deeply influenced by these ideas that I try to write about in the book. Um, and often those ideas continue even into the present and, and as a shaping thing. If you look at new subdivisions, they're almost the same as the 1930s. It's just the houses are bigger. So I think there needs to be some way to get that kind of knowledge made more readily available so people can intervene more intelligently, wh whatever their design intentions are. And that was really a lot of why I, I did the book as I did. Um, probably in, in the future it would be an ebook, you know, and then it would have better illustrations because you could link to various things. Yeah. One other thought I had you know, related to your presentation was this question of uh, community and privacy. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. The thought about community and privacy because I, uh, well, I, you know, I, well, anyway, the book is familiar to me and and to all of us, I suppose. Sixty-three, right? Yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, the, how the uh, Shemaya Alexander could not solve the problem of what to do with the automobile, you know, because that very dense layout you show has no provision for automobiles at all. They, they have a bunch of parking spaces, which most people I know, people but when you want. look at the plan, yeah. they're totally, yeah. you know, you have to walk all over the place yeah, to right, go from right. your house to the car. And this was a huge controversy about people needing to walk a distance from their parking to their house, yeah. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. also yeah. in inclement weather, totally yeah, insane, right. you know. And and uh, so the, the Tellier 5, mm -hmm. you know, Morgenthaler, yeah. uh, amongst others, but they they were able to solve that problem, you know, in, in Siedlung Harlem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, they weren't ever able to quite to repeat it, but right. um, and they solved it by covered walkways, mm -hmm. you know, from that collective garage. Yeah. So that in that sense, of course, they were able to achieve something that Shemayev Alexander just couldn't do, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. couldn't, couldn't conceive, actually. Right. You know, well, I, I think Sert really did have a sort of hostility to auto transportation, that he had a kind of slightly romanticized idea of the medieval the Renaissance city and the public plaza, much like Barcelona. And I think there was an idea that the car was just something to be eliminated rather than accommodated. Right. Gruen, it's different, but then Gruen's real successes are with the shopping mall. Which yeah, right. Other, well, it's a you know, totally yeah. different story yeah. in terms uh -huh. of the way he fits in with capitalism. Yeah. You know? Yeah, exactly. And and uh, the other thing, uh, I, I think you know the, the Peabody Terrace. Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, that's just such an incredible you know, the image you showed of it. No. You know, when you look at it, you think, "What's the problem?" I you know? know. I always have that, that same reaction. Know, what yeah. is the problem yeah. that we can't? Yeah. Uh, you know, that can't be normative. Yeah. You know, yeah. what's the problem? Yeah. You know. Yeah. And and uh, this question of height. You know, why can't we control height? What is the problem? You know. Yeah. Well, the problem is capitalism. Yeah, that's of course. right. That's right. Yeah, that's well, but problem. it's capitalism, but it's also it's also existing culture because, for example, in Cambridge, the project it was seen, maybe still is, is just an example of kind of brutal clearance and basically something hostile to the historic neighborhood around it, you know, which has social dimensions because of Harvard being the building it and the neighbors at that time in a very different economic situation. So, there are those issues also. I think that tend to when architects get the opportunity to do this, there's also these other factors that come in and make it very difficult, so. Well, I mean, in a way, you, you, you can't avoid it, in a sense. Like, yeah, you know, yeah. Then you can't move at all. Right, know? and that, that's the problem, is it seems like stasis has become a norm, and that, yeah. Not only yeah. in architecture. Right, and many, <laughs> and in, in politics as well, yeah, that's right. Right, <laughs> right. I won't. <laughs> no, I, I, I actually, uh, I think that we are, we're actually in a time because of uh, climate crisis that we have to rethink certain parallels. And you know, when I hear that the cars can't be near the house, people can't walk. I, I've I've lived actually three and a half years of my life in Europe, and in places like Venice and Florence and, yeah. and Vicenza, and uh, it doesn't seem to be a problem to walk a certain distance from no. where you shop to where you and, yeah. and not to have a car at all. By the right. way, right. and I just think there's certain paradigms of organ and. They are not designed, but frankly, that doesn't mean we shouldn't be looking at them. We might look at them much more yeah. carefully and methodically. Yeah. But and I think it, we have yeah. to we have to yeah. move to new paradigms yeah. where uh, those of us and I've I have had not had a car most of my life. Mm. It was only when I moved to Florida that it became yeah. something that I had to do because yeah. I lived in San Francisco and Rome and New York and and. Yeah, and uh, uh, this this one doesn't drive either. No, I know. So and he's, he's and Louis Kahn, Louis Kahn never drove. <laughs> Louis Kahn never drove. So, the, 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 but the, you you can't do that everywhere, and uh -huh. not, certainly not in America. Yeah. You 
could do it almost everywhere in Europe yeah. until um, Ameri until Europe began to adopt more uh, American right. notions. But the point is, we have to think of really radical paradigms, some of which mean we have to actually sort of go back in the sense that we have to sort of recognize the strengths of certain other organizations yeah. of cities. Uh, and and the sort of the fact that I, I used to astonish my students at the University of Florida, we would take them from, they grew up in Florida. The city of Gainesville, where our university was, had 100,000 people, but it was 10, uh, it was 100 square miles. It was 10 by 10. Mm. And they went to Vicenza, which has the same number of people, and the city center is one mile by one mile. Right. And they said, but there's so much space here. Yeah. And I said, well, it's just a, it's more thoughtful space yeah. than what you have. You don't think of it as space when it's a suburban right. house. Right. And and it's uh, it was an incredible object lesson. I didn't have to even give a lecture. That, that just, they lived in the city for four months. I taught them a story. But I think uh, we, we've lost a lot of common sense. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's part of the reason we've gotten where we are. I, I just wanted to tell one story, which is, uh, you know, some, I can't even remember exactly when, but in, a, in the auditorium in Columbia, a figure comes up to me after a lecture and, and says, you know, you know, uh, I went to, I, 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 I studied at Harvard, and during that time that I was at Harvard, I contacted Khan, and I told Khan I wanted to come to his office. And then, so Khan said, take the train, don't come by the plane. And he said, why, you know, and then I, I suddenly, it occurred to me, you know, that, that as far as Khan was concerned, you couldn't enter his mythical Philadelphia from the uh, airport by a road. You had to come through 30th Street Station. You know, that's the, that, was the myth, that was the mythic idea of, of the, you know. I think it also raises the issue of different contexts for urban design, which is something I wanted to kind of highlight in some ways in the book, that in Brazil, for example, the issues are quite different than they are in St. Louis. It's an obvious statement, but it really has big implications for what's possible, what you know, what's a realistic yeah, yeah. approach. And um, it's interesting to me to see in East Asia a high-density urbanism that is kind of like Stuyvesant Town, you know, it's kind of reductive, but high density seems to have become completely normative. And that that maybe is a challenge for architects, but I know your work has engaged that directly. And how do, you know, how do we really think about that seriously? I think a lot of Asian architects still look, you know, to the transatlantic world of architecture. Um, how do we somehow put forward realistic paradigms that, that aren't only about um, basically these new urbanist kind of strategies, which Really, no, I'm not even sure they're relevant in the United States <laughs> anymore. But they, you know, they they definitely have never been relevant in a lot of the world. And so, because they take up too much space and they assume a certain kind of single-family dwelling that's just not realistic economically. So um, that, to me, seems like an important question. And I think that you know there there has been some research that's been done on it. Yours and and Jonathan Solomon, people have researched some of this. But um, there's probably a lot more that could be done. Th that's kind of culturally informed, but also architecturally driven. That that to me seems like part of the challenge is how do you connect the field of practice where people are really doing projects and actually have to make decisions with this large amount of historical information, which might not be so easily accessible for them. You know, they're, they're not necessarily going to go look through many volumes of old journals in the library. So, but that brings <coughs> up this topic of the endless city. Mm -hmm. We've already talked about. That. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And and these huge mega cities, which mm -hmm. are, you know, doing what you're referring to, basically. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And and you know, t it's not on. <coughs> it's on. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. You know the the. the well, anyway, the, these mega cities and and. Uh, um, yeah. Well, just this this, you know. Okay, it's a prophecy, but uh, what is it? The, this this three volumes and the end of the city were published in two thousand and seven. On the cover, they've proudly announced that 50% of the world's population lives in uh, urbanized conditions. Men, m much of this is the megacity. Mm -hmm. And then they prophesy by 2050, which is no time at all, it will be 75%. You know. And I mean, there are a number of kind of question marks, like we're going to make it all out of concrete and steel, and uh, are we really going to be able to do that? And uh, yeah. uh, um, and is the mega is the mega city livable at all? You know, uh, uh, yeah.
I think one of the interesting uh, questions is scale and, and uh, you know, of, of these kind of component projects and kind of what, what each, um, you know, what, what is the scope of, of, of that project? Um, my first week at the AA, we took a bus tour of all the social housing projects and it was, um, we started in the 20s and, you know, you had these kind of block size buildings uh, with kindergartens and, you know, all of the components of what you need to kind of live in a city. And it was a, a reasonable scale, like four or five stories, you know, nothing extreme. And then you ended up, I think the last one was uh, Robin Hood Gardens, um, you know, where you have 2,000 people and you're on these narrow, narrow uh, balconies overlooking a very large green space. And I, th I think the question is, is really kind of the design down at, at those kind of scales of decisions and the number of peoples and the way amenities and, you know, what, what are the things that are woven in that capital doesn't create naturally? And, and how is that kind of thought through? I, want, I wanted to also, for me, Eric's book is sort of one half of what the academic world can offer is the distance to step back. and. Mm -hmm. And I was very interested in Jennifer showing that some of the studio work or, or alluding to the studios that you did here, which I was involved with on juries and also um, Igor's presentation. But I think the other half of what we can offer is this, this sort of experiment that can take place in a studio, which is based on certain realistic things, but then other, yeah. other um, normal presumptions are suspended for the, for the purpose of the studio. And I, I think that can be a legitimate contribution uh, not necessarily with design solutions per se, but as a way of questioning certain um, limits, which clearly was definitely going on at the AA um, during the time that you you spoke about, and um, and I suppose continuing when you were a student there as well, Jennifer. So, so I I just think that that's the sort of missing part of our presentation because I think these ideas can be tested here in a way that you can raise issues about whether they're having a good impact or bad, but you haven't yet inflicted any damage. Uh, <laughs> You, it's a, it's a, it's still a theoretical discussion in, in the best sense of the word, in the sense that we can, we can pull back. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. If I can uh, add to that, I think it's a, it's a really one of the key questions: is how do we advocate, as a discipline, for the kind of things that Eric is describing in the book? Because so much of it is shaped by the, you know, capitalist development or just development period, and what is the role of an architect? Uh, I think hinting at drawing, I think that's an important one because it's a tool of imagination that allows people to imagine something very different than the condition they live in. But I also wonder how sometimes as architects we advocate for our own discipline. Um, and what we did over the course of the span of the book that Eric is describing to kind of even out of distract the discipline, like I think out of distraction is not only linked to right. economy, it's linked to also how we as architects advocate for the discipline. And I think the history of the last 150 years or so is the cusp between modernism and postmodernism. And I think that was a very painful transition for the field where in modernism, we assumed an inflated social role of an architect. There was a dangerous myth that came with that. And then in postmodernism, that kind of previous phase was attacked using the kind of social failures to criticize, obviously even some of the formal things that would have worked really well in a different kind of society. I always think one of the best texts on that is uh, Kate Bristol's The Pruitt Igo Myth, where she really unpacks the history of the Pruitt Igo relative to you know, what architects can do. And I think that's an interesting uh, essay for me because she always she talks in that essay about how it led to a certain crisis of the whole discipline, how we lost confidence that we can not only design buildings but also also design cities. And I think that kind of crisis exists still today yeah. in architects trying to do something else other than the kind of physical environment that uh, we talked about relative to Eric book, trying to escape from architecture into another field as a solution that can address whatever capitalism is doing. And if you look at it, even the last 25, 30 years, the, even the word architecture has been removed from many schools of architecture as a way to hit at something broader. Let's say the word design, um, environmental design, built environment, there's all these different variations that try to suggest that there is something outside of architecture that can address the physicality of architecture, which has been a sign of that crisis. I, I, uh, I think that, um, is it on or off? Is it on? Yes. I, I think that, uh, um, I, I think that's very valid and I think that, um, you know, the uh, the profession from time to time tries to kind of legitimize itself through 
you know, inventing new names for itself. It reminds me of the Richard the Welling Davis and the Bartlett, you know, out of which, uh, you know, Boyarsky had a very bad exper brief experience in the Bartlett School of Architecture before going to Chicago and then got, ending up at the AA, you know. Uh, and uh, Llewellyn Davis, you know, changing it to a school of environmental studies, I think, I forget, design or studies. And, and now it's changed back, of course, to a school of architecture, such as a shift of ideology in relation to. And, um, but, you know, you could, what, what you're saying about the present, about, uh, uh, you know, the, the move to uh, transform, up, again, it's starting again, you know, the, the uh, emphasis upon techno science and the uh, calculable and, and, the, and the power supporting that kind of a school and not a school with a bigger cultural or critical aim, right? You know, does it, you can, it's already around. And uh, I mean, it isn't present at Columbia. Columbia has its own, uh, I think, built-in auto-destruction. But, <laughs> but it, anyway, it's a private university, so I suppose it's not so, well, the fees are enormous, of course. But uh, the, the, yes, I mean the other thought is, uh, is you know, ah, yes. What what is the scale at which architects can intervene? And, and this reminds me again of the point that uh, Eric made about Brazil being its own kind of uh, situation, which I suppose, given the political situation there at this very moment, is not in any way enviable. But um, before that, you know, in the time of. Uh, Lula's Workers' Party, there was a woman whose name I can't remember, Suplicy is her last name, I think, Marta Suplicy, who was mayor of Sao Paulo for, I don't know, ten, a decade maybe, and built 42 schools in, you know, favelas, right, you know. I mean, that's an, ama an amazing achievement. Yeah. Uh, you know. yeah. No, there was uh, a, a, a uh, government uh, program called Favela Bairro, which is like favela to neighborhood, yeah. um, where they would look at a particular favela and then build the things that were needed in terms of schools and better yeah. drainage. And so it wasn't about clearance. Yeah, no, 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 at all. It, yeah, yeah. Yeah. no, I mean, there's yeah. no reason why that couldn't work. And, and, yeah. and also that program, for example, which mm -hmm. also could apply here, yeah. I think, you know, in terms of, well, going back to your remarks, Robert, about uh, uh, Herman and uh, the school as community center, mm -hmm. you know, as a, yeah. as, as a yeah. hybrid. I mean, that, and, and, you know, well, just speaking from the many, uh, my misspent life in uh, Avery Hall. Uh, uh, you know, I can't remember when ever uh, 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 somebody had the idea to give a school as a program inside training architects mm -hmm. for three mm -hmm. years. You know, yeah. why not? I mean, what yeah. is the? Yeah. Why is it suddenly schools are just out? Right. 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 It, it's yeah. a really good question. <laughs> yeah. yeah. By the eighties, they were very uncool. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I, I wonder if so. Um, the idea yeah. that. Being done by architects, but are being, is being done by people who don't want architects to have the, the control over it. That they're looking for other voices and other disciplines to enter in, and then trying to redirect conversations that architects haven't solved or that they don't trust architects to solve. Well, yeah, but, but yes. I'm not sure what control we have anymore. <laughs> but uh, we're in control. But, but um, I would also uh, invite anyone uh, from the floor who would like to um, ask uh, one of the panelists or all of us uh, a question or bring up another topic? Yes. Uh, Robert, you spoke of, um, you mentioned uh, that you were skeptical of the term urban renewal and who who was the beneficiary of that renewal. And um, I, I don't want anybody to leave here uh, without being absolutely clear who was the beneficiary of urban renewal. It uh, was, um, it was uh, to the detriment of the blacks who lived in that city, whether it's Portland, St. Louis, it, 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 it doesn't matter, and whether the four, whether the barons, just to name four, Robert Moses, Ed Bacon, Justin Herman in San Francisco, or Harlan Bartholomew here in my hometown, uh, the, the, the policy was 
pretty stark. And I was struck by the term of um, uh, living in cities that looked like they were bombed out after the war, but, quote, you did this to yourselves. And uh, <laughs> so when I get invited to come back to St. Louis, as I am this semester, to, to teach a studio, it's always in St. Louis, always in the city. And the sites that we choose are those reminiscent of post-war Berlin or Beirut, or, and we look at neighborhoods that used to be densely populated, but are not. And so the, so the, so here's, here's my approach. It's not just looking at these, you know, bombed out acres and saying, um, wasn't that terrible? Yes, of course it was. What I'm focusing on is how we can use all the things that we learned to rebuild neighborhoods, which includes th those four or five things that the neighborhood should have, schools, uh, the, the, sort of the walkable aspects that would be in any neighborhood, but in some countries it was a program. We're going to make sure that there's a school here. We're going to make sure that there's a um, uh, a market so that so that if you're living there, you're not living there in isolation, which as uh, the first resident of our apartment in Pruitt-Igo in 56, it was isolated. Those wonderful pictures that you showed of those um, other um, workers' housing that came out of that era they were still connected to the transit schools. You, you, even now, if you go visit some of those places, they're, they're still connected to the rest of the city and not just on this wonderful, wonderful moat in which you were so special, we're going to let you live on this wonderful moat. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. You know, it ties in with something that concerns me and I visit a lot of schools to sit on juries and uh, it's almost inevitable that the project is presented with only the outlines of the site with no indication of the streets on which it fronts with no indication of there might be a site map somewhere but the actual building is discussed in the complete absence of its immediate context forget the larger context uh, so we're treating in some ways in schools it seems on many juries which I've I'm, I'm a bit persistent in bringing this up on the juries, which isn't always welcome. But, but uh, I think we're we're treating our individual projects as if they're a kind of Pruitt Igo, if as you describe it, right? That it has its own little island that doesn't really have to be concerned with the round. So uh, we think it's a good building, but so did the people who designed Pruitt Igo. It's a it's a question of how you're wired into the city or not wired into the city. And you're absolutely correct. It's a good observation about a lot of the particularly European examples is that they're, they're nested right down into the, I mean, they, they have a different morphology for sure, but they're touching and nesting directly into the, the fabric of the city that they're added to. Yeah, I think that, I think that um, we tend to think when we talk about connectivity that it has to be physical architectural car connectivity, you know, streets in the air or some sort of planted boulevards. But maybe the fact that, you know, there is a road network is already a form of connection and that it has different value. If the grid is, you know, small and walkable, to me that seems like that should be more valued and not seen as, you know, a negative. And if it's a sprawling kind of plan where it takes, you know, an hour to walk from one point to another, that shouldn't necessarily be considered a good thing. But planning doctrine being what it was, people like Harlan Bartholomew, their whole approach was basically based on that, was, was you know, sort of easy, sm smooth traffic, protecting property values on large lots, things that are still really in place. So it, it, as much as we may, you know, say, oh, that's a long time ago, if you go out and look at the world of, you know, metro areas, much of that's still in place. So, the, so the, maybe there's a whole issue there of how to have more influence as, you know, the RPAA did in the 1930s on government policy, that maybe there's ways that schools of architecture can begin to exert that. Legislation to get rid of single family zoning, right? Yeah. I don't know. 
Minneapolis also. That's yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. How is that working out? Well, it's um, it's it's, a, it's in terms of like accessory dwelling units. They're trying to increase density. Um, so it's it's kind of hard to displace the fabric that's already there. So they basically it's like building a new house where people are building on top of their garages mm -hmm. or or kind of expanding um, and building upward and outward. But it doesn't really increase density that much. Um, there's, there's a lot of pushback, obviously, from people who are afraid that it's, it's damaging their neighborhood and right. that's code for other things. Right. So. Right. And it's not a new idea. I was traveling back from Southern California to Northern California when I was working in San Francisco and we were flying over the suburbs of Los Angeles and the partner in the firm that I was, um, which is based here in St. Louis, the partner in the firm looked down and said, wouldn't it be smart if we would just fill in to put an extra house on each one of those blocks because it's absurd how much how much these suburbs and those were not new suburbs they were actually qu quite historic suburbs and um, again it's a question of, 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 of density and the benefits of density that um, well, it's, it's also who can afford to add density I mean it's um, not everybody who has a, a plot can actually finance something to build on it other questions from the floor and uh, I apologize if I've asked this at a conference that I've been to before but it's my question of the year um, where do you see inroads for method as opposed to ethos so what do I mean by that uh, you know we spend a lot of time learning and educating ourselves to be knowledgeable to know precedents and to be sensitive, and these are all really great. But often projects that seem to be the most promising have the air of either a kind of particularity or a, a single sort of a sort of mover behind it who was irreplaceable. You know, maybe Curitiba may fall into that. So, which seems to me to be a matter of ethos, like of that person or that place or that sort of group of people. Um, so I'm curious to know if there is some p pr place where pressing method might uh, have some promising outcomes. I think the is that right? No, no. I think that the. Um, the, the, but the big question to to ask is, what do you exactly mean by method? I, I don't know what you are. Lo what do you mean by method? Yeah. Okay. I don't know, but it it would be something that is generalizable that anybody could do. Um, I think of some widely disseminated. Uh, manifesto type documents like Dieter Rams's Principles of Good Design that are suggestive of anybody can do this, but that unfortunately pertain to a very limited scope of design. Uh, so, you know, might there be techniques or tools or, t or subjects that lent themselves to a more generalizable type approach rather than relying on a specific person to, to solve it? Yeah, but I, I think that's the reason why I think the, the uh, P Peabody Apartments of CERT, you know, it, it's, it, they're not important because it was designed by CERT. It just is a particular kind of combination of medium, d medium rise and low rise. I mean, and, and uh, kind of interstitial, interstitial fabric, you know, which is why is it not possible that this would become a pattern, you know, uh, and then you, you come to this point where uh, at least I, I don't know what other people feel, but I think it's not that we don't know. In, in a funny way, we also elaborate the issue, you know, so that it completely escapes the most immediate and direct uh, possibility, you know, so that, I mean, um, you know, exotic projects that are I don't know. They are they're, they're different kinds of spectacle, actually. In, I'm speaking, of course, 
despite the fact that I don't travel as much as Robert by any means, uh, and I don't think I ever did. But in any case, you know, uh, of course, what happens in different architecture schools is very interesting, I think, and comparative studies of what happens in different architecture schools, you know. I mean, uh, how does this three-year curriculum or five-year, four-year, three-year curriculum work, you know, in, I mean, what is the, uh, do the people who are teaching, the people who are running the schools, do, do they ask enough of the faculty to work on the curriculum to ask exactly what it is we are think we are doing, you know? Because I think this question of individual sovereignty, uh, academic, uh, um, you know, the, the principle of sort of academic freedom is if you stay out of each other's way, you know, somehow. But in fact, that means you can't really develop a pedagogy that is, which would answer your thing, I think, if I understand correctly, about method, because, because you have this feeling that, that we, it's, it's not that we don't know what to do. I mean, we, meaning now the society, or, or let's say, uh, you know, it's not that there aren't any models of what might be a solution to our kind of chronic problems, but, but, but it's got to do with the maldistribution of wealth to an extreme degree, and, uh, and also, the, the, you know, a kind of creativity which is sometimes kind of uh, uh, misguided, you know. It, 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 it tries to envisage something that goes beyond anything that might be normative. I mean, because I think you're, in a way, by evoking method, you are kind of moving a bit towards what, what do we consider to be normative? I, w I wonder also, it, you know, I think about the ways that things are reproduced and mass produced in terms of method. And um, like, you know, I think of housing and in, in our city, uh, you see the same kind of, um, you know, uh, market rate housing. Uh, it, it's the same model over and over, the same materials. Um, and it's driven by a financial model. It's b driven by a banking model. Yeah. I think the housing is the same thing. It's it's uh, reproduced by um, development or by a contractor, and it's it's also a financial kind of, you know, how do you get a loan or how do you um, build this quickly? And it's it's based on prototypical floor plans and and kind of construction systems. And I think as architects, one of the things that we were fascinated with in our own research and on these systems is that um, you know they're doing really radical things like negotiating air rights over the street to build over um, to negotiate these kind of connectors to make a large kind of mega structural system out of a city and i think we don't really understand kind of um, the things that are negotiable in cities and and kind of how we negotiate them or how we could um, either build them incrementally or i think of um, i love enzo mari and i you know his auto projection project you know where architects do something radical we're, we're all paid um, by the project but we never actually put something out that we give give the rights over for somebody to do and take and build that's a good model so i think how how we create models and then how we disseminate models is is maybe a method Uh, as you were talking about the the housing model, and yeah, I, I'm I'm from here, but I live in California now. And yes, they are trying to get more density by adding ADUs, and those are relatively small moves. But uh, what about the notion? And I I, I, I totally I agree with the notion, the idea that you know we it's not just architecture. We are urbanists we have to be it's not just what happens in your property line it, it, it can't be but one of the ways that we see some cities uh, addressing this that I, I've been involved with is when you're looking at a new housing idea it's mixed income um, market rate down to 30 percent so you can't tell from looking at the box who 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 lives you know you just can't point at it and say up oh, four people so the idea of the mixed income means that when you're thinking about it in that comprehensive way it's going to have all those other things that the neighborhood should expect uh, connection to transportation uh, amenities walkability but it's it's 
and, and there is a model. It's a lot more complicated than finding one person to write a check for a tall, skinny high rise in New York City. Uh, but it's, 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 it, the result is you have uh, uh, more of a blend of the population rather than I'm only building this for people who can afford the, you know, 65th floor looking, overlooking uh, Central Park. It, it's, 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 it is a lot more complicated, but I think it's just the, so the method is, it's not just a design problem. It's not a design problem per se, because we know how to design. It's how do you finance it? How do you navigate it? How do you, how do you talk with communities? How do you make sure that it's connected to transportation? So it's, it's, a, it is a lot of work, but I, I frankly, you know, that, that model to me is one that is a lot more promising than just, you know, building a, a 65 story needle in New York, which only benefits the people who can afford to live in that needle. And that's that those aren't my clients. I'm, I'm, I'm on this, I'm on the street really. Well, I, I would just say good for you because <laughs> you know, uh, yes, I mean, you know, what satisfaction is there in building these uh, for an architect also? I mean, it, it's okay, it uh, keeps an office alive or more than alive, but, uh, uh, you know, what is this thing, you know, this high-rise building? I mean, there, there, there is this story, you know, the, the high-rise on 57th Street designed by Raphael Vignoli, you know. That, that building is, the elevators don't work, the plumbing doesn't work, I mean, you know. This, this building is in serious trouble because people have pay, paid, you know, 25 million, 30 million for these units. And, and uh, well, it's an exceptional example but of cra craziness, but, uh, yeah. There's a tilting high rise in San Francisco. That's yeah. uh, another, another case, which might be actually much scarier, yes. Um, I don't know, I'm, I'm still interested. I think, uh, to, to get back to Chantel's question, um, I think we have to also, we have to find the method and we have to be able to sort of look at all these kinds of examples and understand the pluses and minuses, but there is also the ethos that we bring, but we have to, I mean, Curitiba wasn't because of an architect, Curitiba, it was, there was this mayor, this sort of slightly, which is, we'd all like a mayor like that, but, um, uh, but the mayor also needed models, which is what we can bring, and I just think we have to be players, we have to be able to be swinging our bats in every direction so that we can offer um, uh, sources of inspiration, also that we bring our own ethos. I, I personally am very concerned about the habits that students have when they leave school, and I don't, I, I know the students here better at this point than I know others, but what is the habit? How were you asked to address your site? How were you asked to address the so-called clients? or the users or the occupants and how how did you grapple with that what were the methods that you were able to grapple with that um or that were offered to you and and obviously variety is actually a, a huge benefit of coming to a school as opposed to learning under the atelier system which is the way frank Lloyd Wright and everyone else learned how to be an architect was basically just go work in an office because that doesn't offer you many different models whereas a school theoretically every studio it starts from scratch and you can have a, have a there, there should be, I feel, uh, a shared set of ethos um, or some, uh, some, some shared set of things that you do and don't do as, uh, as the people who are teaching the next generation of architects. So I think, but I think it, you have to sort of trace it back through everything. That's why for me, it's just particularly irritating to see a project without any surrounding context because I immediately am not I don't know how to assess the project. The reason David Chipperfield made the comment and he used it as the first slide in presenting his developing design for the Davenport is he said, as a European, I don't know what to do here. Do I put it in the middle of the block? That's totally alien to me. Do I put it on a street? But there's the nearest street wall is four blocks away. So uh, how do I make myself part of a street wall? My building's not big enough to re, it's just a very small building. It, it's not capable of rebuilding multiple blocks. So what are the rules? That, what are the rules that I bring? I know how to make a good street wall building, he said, but I, I don't know how to do it in this context because 
because there's no wall for me to work with. And a street wall, by definition, means you have things on either side and you have things across the street. And St. And St. Louis is particularly lacking in street wall um, in many in many areas. So you have to imagine the street wall back again. So. I think that also in response to Chantal's question, I mean, method in urbanism can mean a lot of different things, but if we say it has something to do with bottom up or people working on their own as opposed to a designer coming in and telling them how to live, um, it seems like John Habracken's work is an interesting example, the supports idea where some agency or government or patron of some kind would build the basic shell of a house and then the inhabitants would then finish it. And it came close to being, you know, having a major impact in China around 1980. And then for reasons I don't fully know the, why, it, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't the course taken. Um, but, you know, things like that might, might have some, some sort of value. I think I wouldn't discount the importance of patronage would be another thing to keep in mind. As much as we want an informal urbanism or an urbanism that somehow arises from people's everyday activities, those have to be organized somehow, or otherwise it won't work as a city. There are good examples in Peru, like Previ and also at Villa El Salvador, which was actually put in place by a, mili a leftist military government, but they rehoused homeless people in the center of Lima in a more outlying but walkable environment where otherwise obscure architect laid out a, a gridded plan inspired by Alda von Eich, and um, each block also is a political unit. And it actually still functions successfully even long after a whole lot of different governments have come and gone. And so to me, I, I wrote about it in the book, I was taken there by Sharif Kahad. It's a really interesting project that does to me seem to have potential about how, it, but even there, there is a grid, there's a, a kind of order about where open space is located, where schools are located. So it is designed in that sense. It's not just turning a lot of people loose to you know, figure out their environment. It's indeterminately designed in an open-ended way where the assumption, which was necessary, is that people who live there would build it, that it wouldn't be built by some you know, profit-seeking outside corporation. So you know, whether that's a relevant uh, model for the United States is, of course, a, a big question. But, but, yeah. In Peru, also, Elman Cal. Uh -huh. Yes, right, Aravena's work, yes. yes, yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah, no, there are a lot of good <laughs> examples in Latin America, which you know. Yeah. We've discussed a lot about like potential, like okay, these are these sort of like social sweeping changes, these gestures that architects are trying to make. But as like a student who's been only given like assignments and I don't have much experience in like the actual field, it feels like sometimes it's really easy to feel like you're just being told what to do, and it's hard to like make anything different or make anything new. How do we, as like students and like as this new generation, essentially, um, come up with ways to you know look at the past and make sure we don't make the same mistakes and like how much civic responsibility do we have, should we have? How much are we thinking that we can do? And how much is it just hands off, like this is more idealistic and it's not in our like realm of work? That's a very good question. <laughs> I think the future is in your hand. <laughs> and your, your and your colleagues' hands, the future is in your hands. No, no, but I'm, I'm very serious. You know, some of the examples that, uh, particularly at the AA, there, there was a kind of faculty enabling, but there was a lot of energy coming from the students, and Igor talks a lot about that in, in all of his studies, because it, it also produced quite beautiful, inspiring things. It wasn't just protest for the sake of protest, but Kenneth showed the image of the students taking over the architecture building, and which is my favorite photo of that building by Artigas in, uh, in yeah. Sao Paulo. And that, I mean, that's such an inspiring thing. And by the way, there were people with masks in the front row of that yeah. photo. You need to look at it again. I was shocked. I was like, what, did it get Photoshopped? What is this? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, they have masks on. Anyway, but I think, I think uh, you're, you're, you and your peers are very lucky to be at this school, and we're very lucky to be able to teach you, and, and you, you have to push us. You have to push us to uh, not to tell you what to do, but to, to begin to sort of impart certain limits that we feel are necessary in order for your, the world to be sustained for your generation, right? And I think, but it, in the end, you're gonna inherit this. So the, the sooner you have uh, ownership. But. Well, I think it's, it's a great question just to agree with it. And I would say one of the answers, I think, 
is what your generation will bring to how we think about cities because to earlier point that we somehow cannot move past the automobile city i also think that's a generational thing like all of us have grown up with cars that's like the only thing we know but i do think and maybe this is also a combination of the pandemic the social justice movement all of these things happening at the same time there is a big push now in let's say younger generation or new generations that are moving to different kind of locations for work not to use cars for example there's a lot of discussion about what does it mean to be set up for work remotely what does it mean to be in a particular place and if you just follow the news nationally it's a national conversation now where corporations that had no trouble hiring people like you know two or three years ago all of a sudden cannot hire people because of those questions like the new generations are asking questions about the car and the cost of the car so the only sort of perspective i can offer that maybe it'll take a generational change to shift some of the thinking around the impact for the you know for example of the automobile on the city because it's been quite a few generations who relied on that heavily and maybe that will that will change a bit and um, maybe to link your question to Chantal's question about uh, a little bit because it sort of made me think really hard about this link between the method and the ethics it's an interesting I think conundrum because part of it is I think that they only link when there is some kind of a socio-economic condition that makes it successful right uh, and I also want to be mindful even some of the examples we are mentioning Curitiba for example it is the least diverse part of Brazil. It is the wealthiest city in Brazil by any stretch of imagination. So the fact that this somewhat kind of a model community emerged is also because there was a big exclusion of a large part of the Brazilian society and giving it as a kind of a gift, so to speak, to a particular, particular sort of you know, demographics, particular populations. So oftentimes some of these sort of connections of success are you know enabled by either certain socioeconomic conditions or particular financial mechanisms that allow them to thrive uh, to a certain degree but you know that uh, it's not in, in exactly correct i don't think because uh, it's still on? Is it on? because uh, you know uh, i i knew very well Jaime Lana. i knew how that city operated you know and, and this business of getting uh, trash out of favelas, for example, you know, th there they had set up these collecting points, and uh, and for a bag of trash you could get uh, a bag of uh, vegetables, you know, bought on the market, uh, admittedly at a uh, you know the cheapest, so to speak, or you would get transportation tickets, you know, or a mixture. But I mean, so the, uh, yeah, okay, Curitiba is a particularly good city, but I don't think it's a city of just one, one income by any means, you know. It's, it's, not, it's not that kind of a, uh, exclusive uh, operation. I mean, but on the other hand, you know, we don't know anything about it. Nobody goes there, you know. I mean, we've been over, it's just unbelievable, you know. And, and the other interesting thing is, I think I'm correct about this, is that Jaime Lerner was an architect. He went to Paris and worked for Candidus Yosaka Woods before going back to Brazil and starting a political career. And, uh, uh, you know, a very successful political career. Becoming governor of uh, Paraná, right, didn't he? he yeah, he was, he was the gov state yeah. governor, yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, there are a lot of strategies around it. What I've heard from Brazilians is that the architecture is not very interesting. So that's no, a lot of the reason. Is well, it, it isn't yeah. interesting, but yeah. that, that may not be... I'm not saying that's a good reason. No, you know, like <laughs> you get the back to Mises thing. I don't want to be interesting. I want to be good, you know. I mean, it also reminds me of this issue, you know, in, in architecture schools, which is coming from this student, which is, you know, uh, I'm being taught by, you know, am I really being taught by people who know how to do it, you know? I mean, th that question could arise, I think. I mean, because, okay, there was an earlier time when you, you became an architect by working for somebody who knew how to build, you know. And, and that had very certain positive qualities, I think. One shouldn't... Uh, okay, you, uh, a limited number of people could, 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 could emerge as architects in that system of, of, uh, of uh, apprenticeship, basically. But, uh, you know, in the end, 
th this field is has this craft dimension, this making dimension, and and one of the things that can't be conveyed inside schools is fully th fully that condition. I don't think, but on the other hand, sometimes you know education becomes so remote from that that you know a person can spend a number of years in a school and not have okay the. It depends. I mean, if the education is free, it isn't a great loss. But if you spend a huge amount of money, you know, you end up coming out with a degree, and uh, you know, it's really a problem. What can you do with it? Because you, you don't have any, uh, unless you worked in the summers or you worked in offices at the same time as you were, you got your education. You don't have the experience which makes you employable. You know, I mean, that it's a um, it's a real catch twenty two. I think. I think we're um, drawing to a close, at least in terms of when I have to get this, this gentleman to the airport. Um, but I would like to know if there are some closing thoughts, um, maybe not questions, because I think that would lead to further discussion. But um, And if there are none from the panelists, I, I could give Eric a chance to uh, wrap up for us. I, I think this was a great event, and again, thanks um, to Heather and, and Monica and Robert um, and the panelists, and so um, hopefully it's just the beginning of conversations. I mean, I, I can't help but think there's a value in this kind of discussion, um, maybe more than in the lectures, but just this kind of open conversation with an audience. So uh, thanks to everybody uh, for coming and for participating. <laughs>